Dale Oquist. It was very intense, very directional, very intended. How are you? The better for your asking. God bless you, Matt. <laughs> so knee braces. When did you get knee braces? When my knee started hurting. <laughs> How long ago was that? Um, let's just say it was a, more than a year ago. It's relative, isn't it? How our bodies begin to decay. You know, like I'm 40 and I get a sore back and I'm sure you'd look at me and go, you got, you got no idea. But that's what I say to him and that's what he says to someone younger than him. I'm falling apart slowly, Matt. Even as you, as, even as you watch me, I'm falling apart. Just, yeah. Just very gradually. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good to have you on the show. I mean, I, um, am someone who would like to love Chesterton. And I hear that you're the fellow who could just push me over the edge. Well, I have made it a, a passion of mine to to spread the good news of Chesterton. When I first read him, it was, I need other people to hear about this. I feel like I, I've been cheated, but I'm not going to let anybody else be cheated. When did you first encounter him? In 1981. Okay. I was negative two. <laughs> Nobody asked me. Sorry. <laughs> um, and, and in what context? Were you a convert? Were you... Well, the context was my honeymoon. Just like anybody else, when they start reading Chesterton, they're usually on their honeymoon. Uh -huh. And I was a Baptist at the time. Okay. And like any good Baptist, I, I honeymooned in Rome. This is great. Yeah. And uh, I, I brought my wife with me, which was good. just great to have her with me on the honeymoon. And uh, we were there on the day that Pope John Paul II was shot. I did not see. I did not see this coming. Okay. All right. There's so much to unpack here. All right. Just I want to get to the Pope last. So you were a Baptist. Why did you choose Rome? Just because it's beautiful. Um, a lot my, of history. Yeah. My wife was actually born in Italy, okay. and that was another good reason to bring her with me on the honeymoon because she could speak the language. It was a, much easier to get from one side of the street to the other mm -hmm. by having her with me. And we eventually made our way up to northern Italy, where her relatives lived. Okay. So I got to visit her relatives. But we started in Rome, and we happened to be there the day that uh, the, the great John wow. Paul was, was shot. All right, you got to tell me about it. Where, where were you? How did you hear about it? Well, what was Rome like? Being, being on our honeymoon, we were tourists. We weren't pilgrims. She was not uh, a practicing Catholic. She, she got married in the Baptist church with, with moi. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we were uh, visiting the Church of St. Peter in Chains mm -hmm. and looking at Michelangelo's statue of the Moses, which is one of the great sculpt sculptures of all time, and taking this in, and then they tell us the Pope has just been shot, and everyone's in shock, of course. And our, our hotel was only three blocks from, from the Vatican, from St. Peter's Square. And if, if we had known he was going to make a public appearance, I'm sure we would have gone, because that would have been... You know, an interesting highlight of the honeymoon to see the Pope, even though it was just another tourist curiosity, another marble statue for us, right? And we uh, uh, were told by the, the the group giving us the tour, saying, we can't drive you back to your hotel. You're too close to St. Peter's. You're going to have to walk back. And you know, Matt, I don't think I ever got my money back now that you, uh, now <laughs> now that you bring, bring that up. Yeah. But we walked back and saw the total chaos all around us. It, wow. it, it was... It was unbelievable. And yet, as we walked, it all dissipated. It was like a, a, a storm calming, and everybody went inside to, to watch TV to find out what the news was. And the streets of Rome were empty, and we had the whole city to ourselves. It, wow. it was a you know, once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-millennium opportunity to walk through Rome when it was empty. Wow. And we were on our honeymoon, so we were... We were having a great time. <laughs> Did you have a kind of peripheral interest in John Paul II, just as a sort of celebrity before that point? Did you know of any of his accomplishments as a poet or a philosopher or a playwright? N nah. No. None of that. <laughs> None of that. What about just like an important figure on the world stage? Like, yeah, I knew yeah. he was the Pope. Yeah. I knew that. <laughs> so were you like, were you interested over the coming days as to what had happened or was it just a oh, bit it, of news? W w that... I mean, everyone's mystified. You know, why would anyone shoot the Pope? We were, we were really flummoxed by why would anyone would shoot what are you trying to accomplish by shooting the pope because you know for us good baptists you know the pope's a good guy you know more or less yeah. and, <laughs> and shooting him that's just a bad move that's that's just bad form and we couldn't 
get our heads heads around why he would want to do it. But then, you know, as as things unfold, I, this was one of the most interesting things. Two days later, walking through Rome, you could buy postcards at kiosks with the Pope waving from his hospital bed. Mm. Two days later, wow, yeah, capitalism is alive. Well, and that's you know, it, you know, <laughs> the, being being good non-Catholics, we were saying, yeah, that's the Catholic Church right there. You know, they're going in on this. You know, but. I was just in Italy last year. I was interviewing a fella called Cameron Bertuzzi who had announced his conversion to the Catholic faith, and we were on top of EWTN Studios' building overlooking the Vatican. Been it was there, lovely. Yes. But that night, my maid and I said, well, let's rent some of those scooters. You know, you use the app, it unlocks the scooter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it turns out it's a terrible idea on cobblestone. Oh, see, so you, you, your feelings kind of rattled. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. You're, you're, yeah. But it was still amazing. I mean, it was, it was kind of like what you said. It felt like we had all of St. Peter's and all of Rome to ourselves. We're just going around. On your scooters, yeah. All right, so you're in Rome. You're on your honeymoon with your wife, which yeah. is good. And you came across Chesterton? How? Yeah, so you, you said you were going to bring up the Pope last. You went right to that, Well, by I felt the way. like, how can you yeah. delay that? I know, I know. That's what most people do. It is, it is the most interesting part of the story, but... But for me, but here we go. Now yeah, it's downhill. Yeah. Then someone handed me a book. I, I, uh, I brought uh, Chesterton's book, The Everlasting Man, with me because, you know, what are you going to do on your honeymoon if you don't read, right? Well, yeah. So we were, we, my wife. Were you uh, seriously practicing NFP, perhaps? Or abstaining? <laughs> yeah, thank or you. The time? Yeah. You know, Mother Angelica, you know, she, she uh, interviewed me and she, she made suspicious comments about. <laughs> The Everlasting Man as well. But it's okay. not. what makes the story really good is that my wife was reading Les Miserables. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and she was reading, of course, a Spanish translation of the French novel. Just to impress you. Well, she, it didn't take much for her to impress me, but she, she always did impress me. And, uh, and so she's sitting there crying her eyes out because when Fantine dies, okay. I hope I'm not blowing no. i'm not giving away the whole story but. even if you did i think yeah, by now right. so and she's laughing at the same time that she's crying because she shouldn't be crying on her honeymoon you know she's and she's realized how ridiculous that is and we're, we're having a very good laugh about that and i'm reading gk chesterton's the everlasting man why why did i pick that book up because that was the book that so influenced c.s lewis that was the book that really brought him to the Christian faith. C.S. Lewis was an atheist until he picked up that book, and he said it was the first intelligent explanation of Christianity that he'd ever read. And he said later in his memoir, uh, Surprised by Joy, a young man who's serious about his atheism cannot be too careful about what he reads. And I, I say, I've heard that quote, but that was in reference to his reading of The Everlasting Man. Yes. I didn't know that. Okay. So that's why that's where I started because of the C.S. Lewis connection. Now I should have pointed this out before the interview. I know very little about G.K. Chesterton. I've read, I think, half of Orthodoxy and a couple of his articles. That's it. So this is going to be good for you. So if you if you can help me love Chesterton, then you could help a whole wide swath of people who are watching right now. This is going to be good for you, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It'll be good. But you said you made it your mission yeah, to I, spread the good news. So yeah. here you go. Well, so Chesterton, when I first read him, I would say I grasped maybe 10% of that book, but I knew I had encountered a writer unlike anyone I'd ever read before. Here's someone who really not only had it together, but he wrote about everything. He brings up absolutely everything in that book. He's talking about... Forgive me. What's, yeah. what's the book about? Oh, it's it's basically the history of the world ah. um, it, split up into two parts, the <laughs> same two parts that the history of the world is split up into, B.C. and A.D. So he writes about everything leading up to Christ, yeah. and then how when Jesus enters the stage, history changes utterly, and his argument is that there's no possible explanation for what happened other than the Christian explanation. <clears throat> if, you, uh, <clears throat> if you try to dismiss uh, Jesus as just another historical figure or <clears throat> something that uh, is um, a, a, a strange new teaching or a strange twist in philosophy or any other explanation for Jesus, none of them are as convincing Okay. has the Christian explanation. And history does change utterly when, when Christ steps onto the stage. So it's a work of apologetics. Yeah, I would. I, that's what C.S. Lewis called it. He said it was the best work 
He said it was the best book on apologetics of the 20th century. So was it as, you know, when I read him, he comes across as kind of whimsical and insightful. Is it the same kind of way of writing or is it yeah, more? All of his writing is tends to be whimsical and insightful. But this is a very, very well laid out argument in this book, which is, yeah. I think, a departure for him. He he usually does that well laid out argument in just 1500 words. Yeah. And and takes you through an entirely profound <clears throat> thought, but it, he does it in just one essay. We're here, and I think in orthodoxy as well, it's just this steady train of, a, of an unrelenting argument that y you are backed into the corner by the end of the oh. book. I can't wait to read it now. See? Thank you. I, I, I'll tell you that in March of 2024... Um, Word on Fire will come out with an annotated version of The Everlasting Man that I've, Good. That I've done that. Good, for thank them. you. So that's my great yeah, pleasure. Yeah, Word on Fire, really, I'm just reading right now uh, a commentary, Aquinas' commentary on sections of the Gospels. And and Word on Fire have, are doing such an excellent job with their, with their books. They're beautiful. They're well put together. So kudos to them. Now, you brought up Thomas <laughs> Aquinas. That is true. Chesterton wrote a book on Thomas Aquinas. Yes, I did read that, actually. Ah, good, yes. good. Come to think of it. So, so I've read more than I thought. All right, well, good. Maybe we'll, bring some, we'll pull some more things out of here, out of your subconscious. <laughs> so, I've read everything. <laughs> yeah. So he, uh, the book he wrote on Thomas Aquinas was towards the end of his life, and uh, I think there were people who even thought that G.K. Chesterton had bitten off more than he could chew by taking on the great angelic doctor. And uh, he, he, it's very unclear how much Thomas Aquinas he'd read himself. In fact, he, uh, he had dictated half the book to his secretary when he told her, you need to go to London and get me some books. And she said, well, what books? He said, I don't know. <laughs> so she made some inquiries and did some research and <laughs> returned from London with a stack of books. And he took the top one off the stack and paged through it and from the back and replaced it on the stack and took a walk in his garden and came back and, and dictated the rest of the book to, uh, to his secretary who typed as he dictated. And, uh, was it, was it Gilson or some other? Yes. It was, it was Gilson. Who said it was perhaps the best. Yeah. He said it was the best book ever written on, on, on Thomas yeah. Aquinas. He yeah. said, those of us who spent our lives as scholars trying to laboriously prove these theoretical yeah. The arguments uh, Chesterton has just surpassed us with his intuition. Wow! Yeah, and and he said the, he said he just called Chesterton one of the deepest thinkers who ever existed, and he said he was deep because he was right, and he couldn't help being right and deep, so he made up for it by being funny, and those who see that he was right and deep, uh, they they understood, and those who didn't see that he was right and deep. He apologized by by being funny, and that's all they can see of him. Very good. Wow, that's very insightful. Yeah. Well, it kind of reminds me of you know the fact that I think this is true of a lot of people. If you take a liking to say Plato or Aquinas or Augustine, it's always easier, it seems to me, to read those authors as opposed to what others have written about them. Oh. I wonder if it was his uh, what straightforwardness or childlikeness that enabled him to write. An excellent book that I, maybe didn't get into the weeds. Yeah, I think with with the, Thomas Aquinas, I feel like they were just drawing from the same well of truth together, and he mm. was thinking Thomas's thoughts with him. There's just such a, a connection that he makes with him. It's really a little uncanny how how well he thinks like him. But he does the same thing in his book with, on Saint Francis of Assisi, which is the mm. other great saint he writes about. And, you know, try to try to think of two more different saints than those two. Mm -hmm. And Chesterton wrote a book on, on each of them. And uh, and he goes right into the cave with with Francis and has the mystical experience with Francis where he he sees God. And Chesterton describes that experience. And how could he even begin to unless he somehow was in the cave with him? Interesting. So what people may not know, if they'd known very little about Chesterton, is that he was a convert to the Catholic faith. Now, when Everlasting Man, when when did he write that in the, his faith journey? That was written about three years after his conversion. Okay. Am, so, I, am I right in thinking that orthodoxy was written while he was Protestant or most of the orthodoxy? Orthodoxy was written 14 years before he became Catholic. Okay. Yes. Okay. And so, the, real, the real challenge of reading orthodoxy is to, to f find one line that indicates he's not Catholic because it's almost impossible. Okay. Yeah. 
So you picked up the everlasting man just as a good Baptist, and you knew of him just as a you know, Christian who influenced Lewis. Fair enough. And I heard a couple of Chesterton quotations, but someone told me that someone told me, Matt, that if you if you read Chesterton, you don't even need to read C.S. Lewis because all of C.S. Lewis is in Chesterton. And, you know, I I thought that was a blasphemous remark, but, yeah, in fact, but it helped plant bit. the seed. Sure, sure. And, you know, it was after I after that remark was made to me, then all of a sudden I see Chester's name everywhere and see yeah. C.S. Lewis saying, read Everlasting Man. And so I just kind of followed C.S. Lewis's advice at that point. Did you know he was a Catholic when you read that book? No, I didn't. It took me a while to find out that, C- that Chesterton was a Catholic, and I, I was puzzled by that. And I said, well, he seems to be so right about everything else he writes about. We'll just have to work around that. Yeah, That'll be just a workaround. Right. And, you know, I tried to avoid it as long as I could. And it took, it, it was a 16-year process of G.K. Chesterton escorting me to the doors of the Catholic Church. How long, sorry? How many years? 16. 16. Yeah. So it was 1981, you said you read right. The Everlasting Man. So, and, 1990, and you were hooked. Yeah, yeah, I was hooked from the beginning. And I, at that point in 81, there were only six of Chesterton's books in print. Wow. Which is hard to believe because he wrote 100 books and... And so now there's probably 70 of his books are back in print and plus uh, things that were not books during his lifetime, collections of essays, Mm -hmm. because his books are really only a fraction of what he wrote. Do you know someone who you respect for their intelligence who just doesn't like Chesterton? They think he's too playful, kind of annoying. They can appreciate him, but they don't enjoy reading him. And what do you think of such people? Yeah, I have met a few of those and usually they haven't read enough Chesterton to have properly made that conclusion that's that's how i feel that they really they've they've encountered bits and pieces they may have read orthodoxy or everlasting man maybe but you know books like that you can't read just once you, you have to read them again and and that's when they start bearing fruit is about on the third reading because the mm-hmm. second time you're reading is is the most uncanny experience in the world matt because gk chesterton is one of the only writers who can rewrite a book after he, after you've read it the first time, and then when you read it the second time, he somehow s- s- come come out of the grave and rewritten the book. <laughs> what does that mean? It's because you you're reading this book that you've even underlined yourself, oh, and I you see. say, and you're "I've never, more... I've never read that this had, before. That was not there. That was not there I'm before." Sure of it, I see. Someone has rewritten the yeah. lines on top of what I underlined, and I don't know how they did that. But it's it's a completely new book the second time you read it. So he kind of writes with an accessibility that might be deceptive at first, kind of like Plato, honestly. Yeah. You know, when yeah. you read Aristotle, you're kind of smacked in the face with all this jargon that you need to sort through. Plato, I feel like you pick Plato up, read the Apology or something like that, and you kind of get it. Uh, but there's a depth there that you, I guess, might spend a long time yeah. then ex- excavating. Because when you read the the Apology the second time, there's there's stuff I didn't see that the first time I read mm-hmm. this. So yeah, Chesterton is ever new. He, he he's really an evergreen writer where you're always going to get something out of the same text mm. that, that you've already read before. And so, uh, so reading Chesterton that first time, yeah, I was hooked. I just kept reading more and more. Had to comb through used bookstores at that point and find as many books as I could, and then slowly discovered that there were one or two people out there in the world who also were reading Chesterton. And Before the internet existed, before, you couldn't yeah. find them in little... Yeah, and there was just, there, there were very few people who were reading them, and those who were reading would kind of keep it a secret. They didn't want anyone to know, especially if they were teachers or professors. They Why? Because Chesterton was not someone that you... Uh, was taken seriously at all in the early 80s. So this is the end of the dark ages. Uh, no one was reading Chesterton in the, in the 70s and almost no one in the 80s. And then slowly people started coming out of the closet because we uh, we started finding each other. And uh, Why didn't they take him seriously? Well, as we were talking about, he was considered too flippant, too paradoxical, just dismissed because of his paradoxes. He thought those were just rhetorical tricks. He's being cute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it's not seeing how profound he was, and and also you know Chesterton was writing against every philosopher that they were reading and taking <laughs> seriously. I mean, he he had taken apart Nietzsche, you know, during the when people were still discovering Nietzsche in the early twentieth century, and just showing what an abysmal and 
you know, vapid uh, philosophy it was and, and, you know, pointing out the madness of it. And he's pointing out all the madness of all modern philosophy, how that if mm. you take it to its logical conclusion, it will, it will lead to the, to the mad, the madman cell. You know, that's the, the chapter in, in orthodoxy, mm -hmm. you know, the clean, well-lit prison of one idea. Oh, that's good. And, uh, but not only madness, but self-destructive madness that every one of these modern philosophies holds the seeds to its own downfall and its own destruction. And Chesterton pointed out all, all these things, you know, 20, 30, 40 years before anybody realized it. And then uh, when they started taking him seriously again, then late oh. 80s, they realized, oh, he might have been onto something. So maybe it was a combination of his apparent flippancy coupled with the fact that he's taking down philosophers who it was in vogue to be following at the time. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that was that was certainly there. And um, I, I think, you know, one of the great tributes recently paid to uh, to Chester was Peter Kreef's, uh, you know, four volume collection of the 100 greatest yeah, philosophers, yes. the Plato's <laughs> children. And number 100 is G.K. Chesterton. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Peter? I'm I sure do, yes. Do. I had the great blessing of knowing him. Oh, I bet you guys would have some good conversations. Well, I, I try to listen to him. Those, yeah. We have good conversations in that I listen to him talk, yes, because yeah. why would I say anything? Uh, he's, he's one of the most lighthearted, genuinely humble, joyful men I've ever met. Truly. And truly. at that age, what, 85 now? Or yeah, something? yeah. He's, he's like I, I'm, I'm grumpy at 40. And we picked him up from the airport, brought him to the studio in Atlanta, where I used to live. We got stuck in traffic on the way back, and it looked like he was going to miss his flight. And the whole time he was just telling jokes and oh. you got to watch this movie. Yeah. So Chester played a role in, in his out. conversion too. Chester played a role in Peter Crave's right? conversion. Yeah. And I've heard the story about the church fathers. Yeah. The, the church fathers, of course, the, the big one. And, but then, but you know, he was, um, he liked those, those 19th century philosophers too, when he was studying philosophy and he particularly liked Kierkegaard. Yeah. And, uh, and interestingly, interestingly enough, I did my master's thesis on, Kierkegaard and Chesterton and the concept of paradox in both writers. So, hey. so when he talked to me about his affinity for Kierkegaard, I lit up because oh. I had the same affinity for, for, for both writers. But he said that um, Kierkegaard, he said, might have been enough to keep him a Protestant. Okay. But Chesterton answered all of Kierkegaard's questions. Wow. So that was a nice tribute from, from Peter Kraft to G.K. Chesterton. What's a good gateway drug, book or article into Chesterton for those watching who would like to dip their toe in? Well, I've uh, I've written not one and not two, but three introductory books to Chesterton. So if the if the first two don't make it to your doorstep, the third one will. <laughs> but the, the first one I wrote was called The Apostle of Common Sense. Mm -hmm. And that's just an overview of Chesterton's most important books and trying to make him as accessible as possible. And then the Common Sense 101 lessons from G.K. Chesterton are all the themes that, that Chesterton writes about. And, you know, we get into paradox there and his sense of wonder and uh, all, all, the, uh, all the main themes of his writing, in, including his defense of the faith. And then uh, the third book I wrote was called The Complete Thinker. And that's looking at, really at the world today through Chesterton's eyes. See, I think for me to be interested in those books, and I hope people are and will buy them, I would have to be really hooked on the man to then go and see what someone can then explicate for me, right? Well, I think the purpose of those books is to get people interested in Chesterton, because sometimes just reading the raw Chesterton can be a little too unnerving and... And, and like orthodoxy is a book that a lot of people start and can't finish. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think that's I know me. a guy like yeah, that. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. And so... Yeah. Uh, this this helps you learn what to expect when you're reading Chesterton, and then you're armed and ready to go in there, and then just delight in him because he's so much fun. Well, see this Word on Fire book you've got coming out that excites me because there I get to, if I'm understanding, read Chesterton, and then you help me. It's like you're sitting next to me. You'll be like, it means that you idiot. Yeah. <laughs> in, in the uh, annotations. Yeah, except I use much stronger language than, than you idiot. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> That's really exciting. Oh, go, but still, give us a give us a. Maybe would you say an article would be best? Oh yeah, I mean he's a great essayist. So if you pick up one an of essay, his essays, yeah. such as uh, the Twelve Men, which is about serving on a jury, or a piece of chalk, which is about a hike he oh, takes out into the country, and and yes. uh, what I found in my pocket, and then one of his great essays on lying in bed. Yes, can you lying in bed would be an altogether. You'd it would be a perfect experience if one only had a crayon 
long, long enough to draw on the ceiling. That is so beautiful. That's cool, man. And that, you know, that's almost Chester in one sentence there because you're, he, he's painting a picture and suddenly it's completely different from what you, that's the last way that you expect that sentence to end. Yeah. And and that's what he does. He's, he just takes you on a quick twist and you go, oh, I never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unless you were a child, in which case you're like, that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, that's 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 Chesterton, unless you become like a child, mm -hmm. you know, unless you become like Chesterton, you may not get into the kingdom of heaven because he is the child. Yeah. Mm. I'd love you to tell me about the man. So he was um, doing all of his writing in the early part of the 20th century. He was born in 1874 and basically blew onto the scene around 1900 with a... Uh, uh, book reviews and art reviews in some of the London newspapers. <coughs> and and then in short order, he was in demand as a regular uh, columnist or regular essayist in the Daily News and then the Illustrated London News, two major papers. And everybody knew who he was because of his great paradoxical style and his wit and his character. He was this large guy. He He was bigger than life, six foot four, Mm -hmm. pushing 300 pounds and uh, and completely humble, a tower of humility, and uh, knew how to make fun of himself. Uh, I was about to ask, why yeah. was he, how do you know he was humble? Well, he, he said, I'm, I'm the politest man in all of England because I can stand up on a bus and offer my seat to three women at one time. <laughs> Fair enough. And, and he said, you know, the, I'm sure that the thin monks were holy, but the fat monks were humble. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And and the the story of the uh, the the woman accosting him on the London streets when during World War One and saying, "Young man, why aren't you out at the front?" And he says, "Madam, if you stand on this side, you'll see that I am <laughs> out at the front." Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, and getting out of the cab, you know, uh, Mr. Chester, perhaps you try to get out sideways. And he said, "I have no sideways." <laughs> <laughs> So, so he has he has that going for him, but but um, just amazingly prolific too. So he's just churning out. What was his education prior yeah, he, to writing these? He went to a, a fairly good uh, preparatory school called St. Paul's, where uh, Milton went and uh, Field Marshal Montgomery went, and he became part of a group of fr lifelong friends there that published a little newspaper on their own as students. Hmm. But his uh, headmaster told the. Chesterton's parents don't bother sending him to college or to the university because it's impossible to teach him anything. Mm. And he barely graduated because uh, he was just dreaming and uh, all, just clearly intelligent enough, but didn't care at all about school, but must have learned a few things along the way because he learned Latin and Greek and he could translate French and he won a prize winning poem. And uh, But he went to art school instead of to uh, Oxford or Cambridge, where all his friends went, and uh, dropped out of art school. What was what kind of art was he engaged? Well, in? he was he wanted to be a book illustrator. He thought, okay. but that that just didn't last. Was at he all. any good? At well, his he, we we have lots of his uh, sketches, and okay. and we have his sketches before he went to art school, and his sketches after he went to art school, and there's absolutely no difference. <laughs> So art school had no effect on it whatsoever, <laughs> but they're they're absolutely uh, creative and funny, mm. and just a sure line with the sketches. But draws all these comical characters that look like they just stepped off out of the pages of a of a Dickens novel. Oh, wow! And lots of uh, sword fights, lots of duels, and uh, and so he had that romantic streak going through him. And uh, but he he said by by drop by you know wanting to be an artist, but then dropping out of art school and contributing a few articles to a newspaper, he said he found the easiest living there was. E you know, easy for him to say because he could just write so easily and um, truly one of the most prolific writers who ever lived. He uh, Yeah, give us a sense of that. So he wrote 100 books and he wrote introductions to 200 more books and he wrote uh, probably about 3,000 poems and his books are just on all different subjects. And he, there's several novels in there. There's plays. There's the famous mystery stories, mm -hmm. the Father Brown mysteries. And uh, and yet the books only represent a fraction of what he wrote because these uh, 
uh, essays for the newspapers where that was his bread and butter. That's how mm -hmm. he made his living. And he wrote well over 5,000 literary essays. How many of those do we have? All of them? We have all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that was published, we've, we've pretty much tracked down and it's, it's been a, it's been decades of collecting and finding all those. Gosh, it uh, must be fun for it's, you finding yeah, something that it's gold, gold. <laughs> it's like gold mining. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never forget the thrill of finding some of these old articles from some obscure uh, publication that has a, a Chesterton essay in it, but 5,000 essays is just hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. And he could, this has been confirmed by more than one of his secretaries, he could actually write out an essay in longhand and dictate an entirely different essay to his secretary at the same time. So he could write two essays at one time. That, just like I'm sure you can. Well, like a, yeah. just like I can. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is, yeah, again, back to your point about like Aquinas, who could apparently yeah. dictate to a few yes, secretaries several, at once. Yes. That's insane. It is insane. I wonder what that looks like. So he's probably, I mean, you can't be talking and yeah. writing at the and, same time. And, Maybe you're writing a sentence and then you say something. And that's else. that's what a, a normal person would make that same yes. thing. But the, <laughs> the secretaries, and this is more than one secretary, confirmed no. It was continuous writing and continuous talking. He was doing both things at once. I wonder if he was insufferable to live with. Well, according to the people who knew him, everybody loved him. Okay, good. Yeah, well, and, so we'll, and, and we'll put he, that aside then. And he wrote the way he talks too. So it's not a, he doesn't have some stilted style of of writing. Yeah. That's why he could dictate at the same time he's okay. writing because he he would speak in complete sentences and with the same wit and. Uh, wow. You know, he he was he was his wife uh, said he was the same way in person as he was on paper. Yeah, um, I want to get into his marriage, but not right now. But how old was he when he got married? He was Rough, roughly. Yeah, night. He was it was twenty six years old. Oh, twenty six. Yeah. Okay, so he was rather young. Yeah, and his wife was older. She was five years older than he okay. was. My wife's two and a half years old. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> snagged her. Well, she snagged me. Maybe I don't know. Uh, no, I snagged her. Um, <laughs> So what, do you have any sense of what his daily routine looked like? To, you know, if you're that prolific, you must have a very structured day. You yeah, think. so he um, was a late riser, okay. and uh, his wife, he depended on her for everything, so she <laughs> made sure he got dressed properly and got, uh, got something to eat and sh shuffled him off to, uh, to, to work on the, the morning project and... Um, and made sure he kept all of his appointments. Uh, he was absolutely helpless in that regard and just hopelessly absent-minded because he was focused on what he was going to be writing about for the, mm. for the next deadline. He was always, everything he did was under a deadline. And uh, and so that was the amazing thing. He didn't give a long time to think something out. Uh, no, it was, it was due then and he had to get it done right then. And most of his evenings... Um, he was invited to to speak, and he was a always in demand as a as a public speaker. Okay, and uh, and then he would then write late into the night as well, kind of start organizing his thoughts for the next day. Mm. And, I just watched a movie, which is an excellent movie, Darkest Hour, about Churchill. Oh yeah, and I don't know if it's just the depiction of him in that movie, but like there's some similarities there: the quick wit, the uh, larger than life personality. You know, they were exact contemporaries. They were born the same year. I didn't know that. Chesterton and Churchill. And think about it, when Chesterton died in 1936, Churchill's real career began, and he lived an entire lifetime after oh, yeah. his exact contemporary died. Wow. Yeah. What were some things, what, what was some, like, was he into tobacco, beer? What, what were some of his habits? Chesterton said, some men write with a pencil, and some write with a typewriter. I write with a cigar. Okay. Yeah. He called the tobacco the i core of the mental life. What does that word mean? The i core is the blood that ran through the veins of the Greek gods. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, was he, so was he a big cigar smoker? Yeah. He yeah. was big, and he was a cigar and, and smoker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was he a big, big cigar smoker? Yeah, he 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 did smoke a quite a bit thing. of his cigars. Yeah, and he was yeah. he said he smoked like a chimney, uh, yeah. and usually you know lit the next one after the first one went out because he really he really did draw on that inspiration while yeah. he wrote. And then he he drank beer if he was very thirsty, but his preferred drink was what the English call claret, which is a Bordeaux, okay, so a red wine. 
but he would drink it out of the out of the the pint glass that oh, the uh, okay. that to bring beer out of it. And uh, there's great. He could write anywhere. He didn't have to just be in a quiet study. In fact, he he enjoyed being in the midst of a crowded room while he was writing. He so he'd write in pubs and in railway stations, often in railway stations because he had just missed the train that he was supposed to catch. <laughs> so he he spent a lot of his time in railway stations. But there's great stories of him sitting in the pub and laughing at what he's writing. He's enjoying it as much. He's his own audience as he's, you know, he's writing, damn, that's good. And so, and the uh, the waiter telling someone coming to get him said, your friend, he write, he laugh, he laugh, he write. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was, um, you know, there's just this constant flow of, of thought coming out of him. And, you know, you could say on the one hand, he died too young at the age of 62, but if, if he'd lived longer, my job would have been even more difficult trying to find all the stuff that he wrote. Yeah. Now, I've been told that on the day of his wedding, he bought a pint of milk and a gun. Yeah. Is he, that true? You've got good information, Matt. Yes. Yeah. Well, tell me more about that. So or he, is that it? He, Does that it, sum it, it, was a gla- it was a glass of milk. <laughs> okay. And he, he said he, he bought the glass of milk because he had a great childhood memory of when his mother took him on a special event, she'd buy him a glass of milk. So... The day of his wedding, he thought was a special event, so he wanted to drink a glass of milk to, you know, evoke his youth and evoke celebrating something special with his mother. So that was the purpose for the glass of, of milk. The gun, he said, he bought to defend his wife because they were going to be going to Scotland. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> who knows what you'd find Well, you just there. don't know what you'd get. So that was to, to defend his wife, and he... Uh, um, so he's a, obviously a, def, a defender of, of gun ownership, but he, yeah. he also carried a sword stick. A sword stick? A sword What's stick, that? which is a walking stick that has a sword inside oh, of it. Okay. And he said he did that purely for romantic reasons because he was always imagining someday he'd be able to rescue a damsel in distress. And that's why he carried that. And, and he also carried a big knife. He called it a Texas knife. It, it was seven inches long, but it was 14 inches when you pu- pulled the blade out. And and uh, he he used it to, to sharpen his pencil. <laughs> that's quite intimidating yeah, to anybody went, around him. And that's the best thing, because he, he once did that during a debate. <laughs> While the other guy's speaking, Chester pulls out his knife, and all the audience, of course, is looking at him, <gasps> you know, with a big knife. Yeah, well, I guess that's one of the advantages of being a large man. A large man makes for a large coat, and a large coat can fit more in it. That's right, and because you also have to fit a bunch of folded newspapers in there as well. Wow. So what did he debate on? So he, and, and are there yeah. any famous debates? Oh, yeah, so in? there were a couple of very famous debates. He he debated his, his great friend and philosophical opponent, George Bernard Shaw, on yeah. a couple of big occasions, and they were both debates about socialism. Okay. Chester, uh, Chesterton arguing against socialism and Shaw in one of the debates saying that, that we really think the same way, uh, okay. you know, that, that uh, socialism is, is something that we agree on. Whereas Chesterton is clearly arguing against it because Chesterton was arguing for ownership, small ownership and Chest- uh, socialism is against ownership and against property. Mm. And, but bec- you know, even because of, Shaw's argument that Chesterton he agreed. There are still people who think that Chesterton's ideas are socialist, which which they're not. Well, this is interesting. I mean, we we, we encounter this here in Steubenville, where we have people pushing localism, and it's like we're stuck in this. It's either socialist or capitalist binary, and we refuse to let you break free of it. Yeah, that's exactly the problem right there. Was Chesterton argues the binary really is that socialism and capitalism he argues are the same thing because it's it's just a few people working uh, uh, everybody working for just a few people whether okay. it's the state or, or it's just, just a few, yeah a few <laughs> owners that, yeah. everybody else is a wage slave and distributism which we now call localism is the idea of you own your own shop you own your own property you you are your own boss and you are the employee yeah <laughs> and and that's a different concept from the other two. We'll come back to that. But tell us how he took you or led you to Catholicism then. Yes. So uh, Chester describes the three stages of conversion. (laughs) He says the first stage is you decide that you're going to be fair to the Catholic Church. It doesn't mean you're going to buy its arguments, but you're not going to immediately buy the arguments against it. So you're going to listen to the the fair case being made. You're going to listen to 
the Catholic explanation of things rather than just the accusation or the the dismissal of, of Catholicism from the non-Catholic point of view. And he says the, the problem is there is no being fair to the Catholic Church. No one is neutral about the Catholic Church. You're either for it or you're against it. And as soon as you stop being against it, you start being for it. You start kind of rooting for it. So the first step of trying to be fair to the Catholic faith is usually fatal. <laughs> That's and, interesting. Yeah, and then yeah. the second stage, he said, is... This, just to pause yeah, on that for a yes. moment, I mean, I, I engage with a lot of people who watch this show, who comment because of the wonderful guests that I have on who say that they're coming into the Catholic Church. And I see that in them as well, right? Where they're like, there's something kind of attractive about this weird wrong religion that surely has a lot of things right. And we shouldn't be so prejudiced and, ooh, careful. They're, they're, careful. In, that, they're in that first dangerous fatal stage. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So you've seen it yourself. Great. Yeah, very well, much. And then the second stage, which is come, follows right on it, is the... Um, discovering the Catholic Church, just learning all the things you never knew about it. And uh, he says that's like being in, in this foreign country with these exotic flowers and butterflies that you never re- knew existed, and you're just taking it all in, and this is really interesting. And you, the great part is that there's no commitment. You can turn around and leave any time you want, and that's the, mm-hmm. that's the fun stage of conversion. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. I like that. But then comes the third stage. Uh-oh. Running away from the Catholic Church. <laughs> I mean, you, you fooled me, and I let myself be yeah, fooled. Exactly, because your 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 intellectual arguments have been answered, but it's still going to be a question of the will, and your your heart's trying to help you find a way out because yeah. your head has been convinced, and you have that voice telling you, "Do not do this. Do not do this," because everything changes. You can't go back if you do this. And something is trying to prevent you from making that final step. I was chatting with someone across the table here recently who had fallen for those first two stages and then was worried that he was going to become Catholic. And he met Steve Ray and said to him, you know, I'm feeling a little anxious here. I think I might become Catholic. And he said, all right, you have two options. You turn around and you run and you never look back. That's your only that's the only option. Or you become Catholic. I want to tell you about a course that I have created for men to overcome pornography. It is called strive21.com slash Matt. You go there right now, or if you text strive to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free, and it's a course I've created to help men to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, We had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, And I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret it. I was chatting with someone across the table here recently who had fallen for those first two stages and then was worried that he was going to become Catholic. And he met Steve Ray and said to him, you know, I'm feeling a little anxious here. I think I might become Catholic. And he said, all right, you have two options. You turn around and you run and you never look back. That's your only that's the only option. Or you become Catholic. Well, that's that mirrors something that Chester himself said which really opens up a large parenthesis, which I'm happy to do. Because people always ask, well, why didn't C.S. Lewis become Catholic? Why didn't C.S. Lewis become Catholic? You just asked the question again, per what I was saying. People always are asking that question. (laughs) Well, Chesterton answered the question, even though he never knew C.S. Lewis, but he answered the question. He wrote a book on William Blake, the English mystic and poet and painter. And in that book, he says that if every man lived a thousand years, every man would either be a nihilistic atheist or a member of the Catholic Church. Mm. He said those are the only two options. Chesterton said this. Chesterton said this. And so he said, people were wondering, was William Blake a Christian? Was he Orthodox? And well, Chesterton says, 
there's some weird things about William Blake, but he's clearly, he's on the right road. And if he had lived longer, he would have become Catholic because he certainly was not moving away from the Catholic Church. He wasn't moving towards this nihilistic atheist. He was moving towards a fullness of faith. And he just didn't live long enough. The answer to the C.S. Lewis question is he didn't live long enough. Mm. He was on his way to becoming Catholic. So what what evidences in his life and writings do you see of that? With C.S. Lewis? Yeah. Well, he... The acceptance of purgatory would be one. Well, yeah, the acceptance of purgatory is a big one. And basically... He had, in essence, accepted all seven sacraments before his uh, his death, which, you know, he, he had the sense of the real presence. He had a sense of, uh, of confession. Uh, he was embracing all those things. And, and the fact is, his arguments are becoming more and more Chestertonian in all of his uh, writings. When I, when I read Chester, when I read Lewis, I always say, oh, well, here is where Lewis got this argument, because here's Chesterton making the same argument, and that Lewis, be, Lewis okay, would have read he, it. Here's your new book idea, side by side, Chesterton, and then what Lewis picked up. Good, him. I'll put that on the list, because i got to get three more books done, but that'll be the fourth <laughs> one, right. Matt, and I'll give, you a, I'll, no, I'll dedicate it to no, you. Just a dedication right. would be sufficient, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but now here's the other great thing, though, about that, that William Blake book. Yeah. Chesterton wrote that, that line 10 years before he became Catholic himself. <laughs> oh. Fascinating. Yeah. So he's he's clearly saying there's really only two options. Just like Steve Ray was telling that guy, either you run away from the church or you join it. And that's what the, that's the third stage of conversion. You're trying to get away from it, but ultimately you're going to turn around, you're going to enter it, or you're, or you're going to leave. But uh, it ends, as Chester says, with your head bowed. It's an act of humility to enter the church. And when you enter you see that the church is larger on the inside than it is on the outside. And all the time you were out in the narrow, dark place, and inside is this place bigger than the universe. What did he say in that regard about stained glass windows and the comprehensibility of Catholicism from within? Is that his well, he, idea? He, he talks about stained glass windows in, a, in another essay called The Fading Fireworks, where he talks about the, the difference between fireworks as an art form, which is Eastern, you know, the idea of this explosion with a dark background. Okay. And uh, yeah, and so it's light against a dark yeah. background. And stained glass is the light comes from behind the art okay. and illuminates the art. And so it's the difference between the Asian or the Eastern philosophy and the Western philosophy. One is flashes of light in the darkness. The other one is the illumination of, of everything from behind because the eternal light is behind everything yeah, yeah. that we see. It's a, That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I heard uh, someone say, it may not have been him then, that you know, just when you look at a beautiful cathedral from outside, the stained glass windows are incomprehensible. It's only once you enter that it makes sense. And the idea being that sometimes Catholicism can be confusing until you allow it to pull you in with its tractor beam. I want to say it wasn't Chesterton that okay. said that. How frustrated do you get when people attribute false quotes to Chesterton? Uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. So, <laughs> in fact, I think Chesterton's probably his uh, most famous quote is not his is quote. one he didn't say. He he almost said it, but he didn't say it. But everyone quotes it wrong, and we'll just let it go. Do we not want to point out what it is? Well, or should we just let it let it? We keep could. Going? We right. could. It's it's. When a man stops believing in God, he doesn't believe in nothing. He believes in anything. Okay, it's not what Chesterton said, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna quibble. It's a good quote. It's, it's a Chesterton idea. Uh, what did he say similar to that, or was it? He he did say once that um, uh, a pagan is not a man who believes in nothing. It's a a man who believes in anything. Okay, he did say that, yeah. which is pretty close to it. Yeah, yeah. But he also says in, in a Father Brown story. Um, th- that he, he says the, the first effect of not believing in God is you lose your common sense. Okay. But then in another Father Brown story, he says, you see, you weren't, you were willing to believe in anything. You know, as soon as you stopped your superstition, you were willing to believe in anything. So if you, if you take those two quotes and put them together, you get the quote yeah. from two Father Brown yeah. stories. So the concept is there. Yeah. But so to answer your earlier question, people... If if it's if it's a good paradoxical quote, it's often attributed to Chesterton, yeah. and that just shows that he has that effect on our on our thinking. Yeah. That if it's a paradoxical line, if it's some something catchy and witty and quotable, it's true. It's, it was Chesterton who said it. 
Yeah, it's it's funny, you know, whenever you find a quote that apparently came from Thomas Aquinas, if it's if it's too sugary or sexy, like he no, he never wrote that. <laughs> Um, it's difficult to mine Aquinas for really cutesy little quotes, but Chesterton, if he does one day become a saint, will be the saint of excellent, quick. Yeah, short. the the, yeah, the 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 saint of the aphorism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Golly, that would be an amazing book. Yeah, all of his aphorisms together. There's your next book. Uh, it's, I probably will move move that up behind <laughs> ahead of the other the C.S. Lewis book. <laughs> Did his wife convert, or was she already Catholic? No, she was not already Catholic, and she. Uh, she did. I think the reason for the delay in his conversion, I think it's pretty well accepted. The reason for the delay in his conversion was that she did not want to become Catholic. She was not ready to. And she was a profound and devout Anglican. And uh, and so he was finally ready where he, he, he couldn't wait anymore. And, and she knew and was expecting him to become Catholic. Uh, he wanted to do it with her. He wanted to do the most important decision of his life with the most important person in his mm-hmm. life who without whom he did nothing because he depended on her for everything mm-hmm. and they just did everything together and so it was a, a remarkable and and difficult step to take that to take that step by his own and they were they were both happy she was happy for him because she knew that's what he wanted he was happy because this is what he wanted, but they were both sad at the same time. It was bittersweet. There were tears because suddenly they didn't share something that was really an essential thing for them to share. Yeah, and uh, and it did end four years later when she she became Catholic, but it did take four more years. Mm. And uh, and then they they, they shared th- that as well as everything else. You know, the the other thing about his uh, his becoming Catholic, which is very very amusing is that uh, it was a surprise to the rest of the world. In fact, they, it wasn't even announced uh, that the two priests who received him into the church, one of whom was the basis of the Father Brown character, Father John O'Connor, uh, they decided, let's, let's not tell anybody. Let's see how long it takes for, for it to get into the newspapers. So they just, they just didn't announce. No one said And it was about... Uh, it was about six weeks before the news came out, and then and then it was everywhere. It was I mean, newspapers all around the world. Chesterton received into the Catholic Church, and people were shocked because a lot of them thought he already was Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> He'd already been writing the Father Brown stories. Yeah, and then there were some who said, "Well, he'll you know he's he's too intelligent. This is like George Bernard Shaw fires off a letter to Chesterton saying, Gilbert, this is going too far,' <laughs> you know, because." They didn't think anybody of that giant intellect would do something that stupid, and uh, and the Anglican vicar of uh, of Beaconsfield, the town where Chesterton lived, said, "Well, I'm I'm glad that Chesterton's becoming Catholic. He was never a very good Anglican <laughs> because he never attended the Anglican Church. He okay. he had a Christian theology, but he just didn't even go to church okay. as a as an Anglican." And, Becoming Catholic, he never missed his day of obligation and often was a daily communicant mm. as well. I was about to ask that. What sort of devotions did he treasure? Do you know? Yeah, so he um, every time he traveled to London, because he lived outside of London for the last uh, 20-some years of his life, and uh, and he uh, every time he went into London, he would go to Mass at, at Westminster Cathedral. So he was often seen there and seen praying in front of the, the, uh, the Blessed Sacrament. So... Clearly, that becoming Catholic did manifest itself with with physical devotion. We know that he he had a well well used rosary, but there's he never talks about the mm-hmm. the rosary, and it's one of the, the things about you know the uh, trying to get him canonized is that you know when you're a member of a religious order, at some point usually your religious superior says, "I want you to write down all of your spiritual life right now. I want it on paper." and uh, Otherwise, no one w- would have done it. These these uh, these saints would have done it unless it, they were following a, a command of their superior. Well, Chesterton didn't write about his personal life. He didn't write about his personal spirituality and about his prayer life because it was a private matter. And yet, you have to kind of you know infer it from the other stuff he writes about and and from eyewitness accounts of of those that are existing where. This was a holy man. This was a devout man. Uh, the evidence of, of what he did for the poor, what he did to help out other people without any getting any credit for it. And, and uh, one of his best friends saying he was always thinking about God. He was always thinking about God. 
what are the objections people raise then to say, look, we love that you love him. We, you're clearly into him. And sure, he was a great writer and had some awesome insights and was very brilliant. But he's not a saint. Yeah. What, what are the objections they put forth? That are- well, I think there's probably three three of them. That, the first one is people don't know what a lay saint looks like. Mm. You know, they, they know what... Um, like you a know, Carmelite someone, nun looks They like. look what a Carmelite yeah. nun was or a missionary of charity or a pope. You know, those guys are they're living the religious life and it, their, their work is so obvious it's being worn on them. And there are very few lay saints because there aren't people organized to get behind them to get them canonized. You know, a religious yeah. order gets someone canonized because they know exactly how to do it. And, ah, and so just getting a lay enough. person... So, you know that we we are seeing this growing devotion to Chester and around the world. We we have these prayer cards. We've given out thirty thousand of them. So there's a lot of people who are okay. are devoted to Chester and asking for his intercession and and seeing results from those prayers. But it it's just more difficult to get a lay person canonized. The other thing is that Chester just doesn't fit the uh, the image of a Catholic saint. You know the 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 size and the cigar, the the drinking, and 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 Chester's arguing that these are. These are historical customs that that the common man enjoys, and he was defending them because they were actually under attack by mm-hmm. by Puritans. He was writing during pure, uh, Prohibition, and well, given that it came to us through the Native Americans, I conclude that it must only be an act of racism <laughs> that would get people to complain about cigar smoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 amazing. So. He, he he wrote that very thing. And there's people who are arguing about whether there are cigarettes in the Bible. He, he says that line. <laughs> I don't know. What's the line? Well, no, Chester says that. He, one of That line is in Chester. Oh. The people who are arguing about whether there are <laughs> cigarettes in the Bible, as if that has something to do with salvation, you know. Mm. And uh, and so he, he lived a joyful life and a convivial life, and he spread that joy to others. But it just looks different from what our image is. Of, well, you know what's going to be funny in this day and age of social media? I mean, if, you, if anybody has a social media presence, it's going to look weird one day if you're beatified, say, you know? Well, that'll look really weird. Wouldn't that be weird? Like, <laughs> yeah. here's his tweets, here's the ones he probably shouldn't have sent out. Yeah. But, you know, impulse control is difficult on these platforms. That's going to be weird, too. Yeah. I, I was once sitting having a coffee with a fella who said, I'm, I'm, I, he said he's a Catholic. He said, I'm offended. I'm offended that there aren't more married saints. And... You might say get over it, you know. But if you if you kind of give him the benefit of the doubt, I, I can see where he's coming from. Yeah, and this is why some people who are devoted to Chesterton believe that Francis, his wife, should be elevated with him because they were <laughs> two shall become one. And yeah. how could how could Chesterton exist without her? She was so instrumental for him being the person that he was. So that that there's a good case they should be. Uh, well, you've, given, you've given a couple of examples as yeah. to why one might consider him a saint. I mean, I. have really have no doubt if I'm allowed to say that the man's in heaven, uh, but um, but that he should be a canonized saint. I mean, you said he had a friend who said he always thought about God. He would go to mass frequently. He would pray the rosary, presumably, because of the worn out rosary that you mentioned. Uh, he spread joy, people said. I mean, wh- what else? What well, I, think, else I think one of the great arguments... <laughs> Pretend I'm the devil's yeah, advocate yeah, and you've yeah, really got to convince yeah, me here. Yeah, you got to do a better job too. Because <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, you have to convince me as devil's advocate and you're not even coming close. No, um... I think that one of his, uh, the great arguments in favor of his of his sanctity is the fact that people who encounter Chester want to become Catholic. And it's not just his great arguments for the faith, and he's, which is, are brilliant. I mean, you, you read his books, you want to become Catholic, but you're drawn to his goodness. That's what you're drawn to with Chester. And his goodness comes out of his words and out of his, out of the pages. That That's what you're struck to. You're drawn to someone who clearly is virtuous and i want what he has and uh i think that's one of the great arguments for his his sanctity um i uh i think one of the uh the things that that will all uh, that will continue to be used against him is an accusation that he was anti-semitic okay and um give us give us the steel man argument as to why he may have been and then show well, us why he wasn't you know he he made some critical comments about the jews but he also made critical comments about americans and about germans and about scots yeah. and about my people the scandinavians what uh-huh. he said about them are but <laughs> but they what did he say about the jews uh, he's he, let's see if we can get banned yeah, from youtube well, go so well i think his his uh main argument about the jews is that they were a people in exile and they suffered from being a, a nation without a country. Uh-huh. And so wherever they were, they were outsiders. 
and uh, and so he he considered them foreigners in England because their their interests were for the Jews and and not for the English. That was his argument. Right. And and this is someone who grew up with Jewish friends and treated them as if this is a sim- it sounds like a similar critique to what Protestants had of uh, Catholic uh, Catholics in America. Yeah. Your yeah, allegiance is to Rome. Yeah, we can't trust you. Yeah, and that that was that was part of part of. His, but he said this made him a Zionist. This is why he defended the the right of the of the Jews to have their own homeland. And the Jewish Zionists, you know, recruited Chester to help ah, to help them. And so there were there were lots of Jews who really valued uh, Chester's so friendship. What was his argument for a Jewish state then? That or, that they should have one. That but they should why? have one. Yeah, but why? Because they were they were a historic nation and they deserved the their their own country uh, and they they had been exiled from their own country and they deserved to have their country back. So he was accused of being anti-Semitic on one side and then you've got these the, people wanting to say on the other yeah, side, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, and he also warned that there would be an outbreak of violence against the Jews <laughs> before Hitler came along and huh. and he said the stupidest thing that the German people could have ever done in 1933 was to elect Hitler. And then when Hitler started going off, off against the Jews, he said that Hitler's made now he's made the worst mistake. He's he's gone after the the most famous scapegoat in history. Well, uh, you've shown us why he's not anti-Semitic, but I asked you to steal man why he might be. Yeah. So what are the lines, or what did, what did he say that what, people look at out of oh, context, perhaps? Yeah, and, well, sure. Like you know, he'll he'll make comments about hook noses, okay. uh, things like that. But he also makes comments about Roman noses too. Right. So right. you know, so every argument I get. So we're give probably you a lot more sensitive to this after yeah, the Second World War yeah. in a way that we may not have been prior to Absolutely. it. Absolutely, and I yeah. I think it's unfair to to view him sometimes through that lens. Right. Um, I think it, the whole argument is unfair, and I think it's unfounded. And I think sometimes these arguments are simply repeated as a way of just dismissing Chesterton wholesale without having to encounter his his great arguments, you know, for for the Catholic Church and and for the truth that, mm-hmm. that the Church teaches. If you can get rid of him with just one quick argument, well, he's anti-Semitic, so no, nothing he says is worth anything. Yeah, and. That's I think sometimes it's used in that way. Right. I think most of the time I believe the accusation is ignorant, but sometimes it's just simply malicious. Gotcha. Yeah. So, but it's rubbish nonetheless. I Not believe it's rubbish. Understand. And I'm yeah. gonna, the number three book that I'm on that list of books. I, I'm, I'm going to be trying to do a, a full exhaustive uh, yeah. argument uh, to defend Chesterton against all the different accusations. But we did in Gilbert Magazine, the magazine we published a few years ago, have. One issue devoted to the mm. to, and I think it's I think it deals deals with all the arguments very well. Well, that's one kind of objection. I guess another one would be that maybe he drank too much. Maybe is that is that that's one I hear. Yeah, that argument is made. Or that he was too and that um, he ate too much, ate too much, yeah. drank too much, smoked too many cigars. Yeah, and so uh, I've, I've I've written about that too. Chester actually ate very little. He had some sort of a glandular condition that was responsible for his great weight, and uh, all of the eyewitness accounts were amazed at how little he ate. Um, I don't believe there's any evidence of him ever being drunk mm-hmm. in public or, uh, you know, uh, so we don't, we don't see him as a, uh, as someone indulging in that, in that sense, but who d- defended, defended drinking as uh, this other guy who was saying, uh, who's that guy they said came as a Drinking and eating and and behold a glutton and a I forget yeah I'm sure it was history's one of those, written yeah, him so off anyway, anyway some guy who was yeah. accused of eating and drinking was called a glutton and demon and all that stuff yeah. but he defended he defended <laughs> you said because it was the it was the everyman's yeah especially the everyman was who was being under attack <clears throat> by by the Puritans and you yeah. know and 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 the really the killjoys uh, this yeah. is a a, a customary historical thing is is the fruit of the vine and the yeah, of of the wheat to the grain. So, and, and then um, yeah, so they they think he would be ill tempered in his in his uh, temperance. And Chester was actually a defender of what he called true temperance, which is not, you know, abstaining, but to everything in its in its proper proper use. But he knew how to abstain. He did. He, he went through fasting just like anybody else uh, mm-hmm. in, in the Catholic Church does. He. He he knows the rhythm of the season, when it's the time you partake and the time you don't partake. So what do you think uh, is likely to happen with Chesterton and sainthood? I mean, what's the trajectory? In- yeah, we uh, we do believe that there will be a bishop who will be opening the cause within the next year or so. I really think we're, we've got two 
two bishops who are in dialogue with who are very interested in opening his cause. And once the cause is opened, mm -hmm. then then we start getting serious of, of appointing a postulator and doing doing the hard work. And I, I don't know the answer to this. So what you just handed a card, a, a prayer card, you know, to Chesterton, what's the rules for praying to people who haven't been recognized as well, servants of God? The, or? the only the only way anyone ever becomes a, a saint. Boom. Done. Yeah. So it's excellent. It's, it, I never, the, yeah. Obviously, that's the case. The Catholic <laughs> Church doesn't say, who are we going to make a saint this week? Yeah. It's a group of people who are devoted to a particular figure. They go to the Catholic Church and say, we think this guy that we're devoted to is a saint. He's been yeah. answering our prayers. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it starts with the prayer card. <laughs> Tell us about your society and the schools, Chesterton schools. Yeah, so we started the Chesterton Society, which was just going to be there to promote uh, a wider interest in G.K. Chesterton. That was started about 27 years ago. Okay. And uh, and then in 2008, I helped start a new uh, ca Catholic classical high school in Minnesota, where I'm from, Chesterton Academy. And that, was, that school uh, had a really good uh, curriculum, really integrated curriculum, and we wanted something that would have that good, strong uh, intellectual rigor to it, but also very faithfully Catholic and affordable. Mm. Three things that you couldn't find together in most schools anywhere. And uh, the first school started very modestly. It continued to, to grow, uh, and people started finding out about it, mostly because of the work of the Chesterton Society, reading our magazine. And when I'd go around the country giving a talk, people would ask, what about that school you started? So. <clears throat> All of a sudden, we start getting phone calls saying, "Hey, uh, what's, we want to start one of those schools too." And what's it called? Yeah, what's how it do you, called? Yeah, so one of those Chester Academies. And how do you do that? And so we said, "Well, this is how we did it." And by 2014, two or three other schools had started, and now uh, in 2023, there's there are 70 schools. There are 69 schools. Wow! And so it's just been an explosion. Mm. of interest in classical Catholic affordable education uh, with a really strong integrated curriculum so that mm. the it's the opposite of the way modern education works because most of it is, as, as Shester says, the separation of everything from everything else. We just teach all these courses as if it's one wild divorce court. Nothing is connected and, and students learn in fragments, they think in fragments, and if you listen to them talk, they talk in fragments. Yeah. And we try to give them uh, a very articulate view of the world by teaching four years of philosophy, where most high schools don't teach any philosophy, and four years of theology so they can have an eternal grounding in what they're learning. Mm -hmm. And then a, uh, a strong literature, a great books program, so they start with Homer, and they'll, by their, ten, their 12th grade, they're reading Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and then a, a, a historical uh, backbone so it, it, they can see where it all fits in history. And then a really well-developed arts program. So they all learn how to draw and paint. Mm. They all learn how to sing and study music for four years. And they all learn how to be on stage. They learn how to present themselves and learn how uh, drama works, how it's this integrated art form where you really bring the word into flesh is what you do yeah. with them. Yeah. And and so a truly complete education with the centerpiece of every day being the mass. We have daily mass and most of the schools have daily confession uh, available as well. So well, I'll just say, you know, my son was homeschooled up until very recently and now he attends Chesterton Academy here in Steubenville. And this morning him and I were up uh, early and he said, dad, I'm going to, um, go out after school and me and some fellows are going to adoration at the because of Chesterton's you know the, yeah that and that's what's great so at our uh, at the first school that we started back in Minneapolis right now at, at the seminary in St. Paul Minnesota seven of the seminarians are graduates of our of our Chesterton Academy mm. so we're, we're making vocations as well and that's just we're seeing all these good things happen and now this movement is growing like like wildfire, because it's tr truly a grassroots movement. And talk about uh, so something that's a real antidote to what's going on in the world today with the culture of nonsense and the culture of death. Here is so here's something that's truly wise and truly full of life. 
and you know, well-formed young people coming out of this. It's, it's very exciting. It's going to sound like a tangent, but I don't think it is. You said Chesterton lived, obviously, through the, se- through the First World War and not the Second World War. Right, he died in 36. Right. Okay, so he's living in a turbulent time, and yet he has this joy and levity about him. And that's always strange. I think that's kind of like they'll know we're Christians by our joy as well, you know, because how, how, are you, how is it possible that you're smiling? Don't you know about this and that thing and the world falling apart? How dare you? Yeah. You know, you said this wasn't a tangent. It was a tangent because that, I think we see the same joy in the Chesterton Academies. And I think that's part of the secret sauce of G.K. Chesterton as the patron of these schools. These are joyfully Catholic young people. And you can't read Chesterton and not be joyful. He, he gives you just the right amount of intellectual detachment from the world so you don't have to be depressed by it. Mm-hmm. And also gives you this compassion for the world so that you can love it and, and also be amused by it at the same time. You know, just the, the way uh, his attitude is always completely the opposite of what the, the modern and secular and godless view is. And that's what is so refreshing and uplifting because everyone else will give you a reason for being depressed. But if if God has made the universe and has redeemed us, why shouldn't we be very happy that we have such a great creator and Mm -hmm. such a great redeemer? Why wouldn't that be a source of joy? And if we truly believe that we're on the winning side, then that's got to change your countenance. Like if you're under attack and you're not sure who's going to win this, then fair enough. There's cause for depression maybe or anxiety. And certainly there's cause for both in certain instances, I suppose, at least anxiety. But uh, but if you know that you're on the winning side, Christ is victorious. Yeah, and, and being, on, being, being on the winning side does, has leaves us no reason to be arrogant because the side isn't winning because of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, if people will, uh, want to learn more about the schools, is there a website they could go to? Yeah, go to chestertonschools.org. Chestertonschools.org. a simple <laughs> URL. I appreciate that. <laughs> and that, that tells schools. people what the school is and, and how to go about starting a school as well. And you have a magazine with your institute. Yeah. How well, do they get they, connected to so that sort of thing? Gil- Gilbert Magazine is published by the, uh, the Chesterton Society. And, and oh. that, this, and this is a really difficult website, All Chesterton. Right. Dot org. Okay. <laughs> well done on getting that. Yeah. So did you set up the society? Yeah, I'm oh. I'm the, I'm the co-founder of the Chester Society, the co-founder of the of the schools, and it was a different <clears throat> different other co-founder in both cases, but I'm the last man standing in both cases. Okay. So. Now we we jumped we I jumped over something uh, which I or I'd like to come back to, you talked about the three stages of conversion. Maybe you could sum up for us how Chesterton led you to Catholicism. Yeah, so Chesterton himself had a very deliberate conversion. It was a very intellectual conversion, and it was a very long conversion. From the time he really started thinking about the Catholic Church, it was probably about a a 20-year process for him. And I have to characterize mine quite the same way. It was very deliberate, very long, and it was very intellectual. It was one of those intellectual conversions. It wasn't you know, some uh, great mystical experience or some great emotional experience. As I say, you, you can't become Catholic at a Billy Graham crusade. You know, you, you have to go through a process. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the interesting things about the Catholic Church is that when you decide you want when to you become say, Catholic. Ready, yeah, I'm like, ready. Well, to we're go, not. Okay, we're going to, yeah, this, this yeah. is what you have to do. I said, what? But I want to be Catholic now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember Peter Graves, he had, a, he had the great story of when he went to the priest and said, yeah, I, I want to become Catholic. And, and the priest said, oh, well, who's the girl? <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, was, yeah, a little cynical, maybe. Yeah, but. yeah, a little bit. Because uh, he, you know, he was attending a Calvinist college when he when he made the yeah. decision. But I was, uh, you know, I was raised with a very, you know, Baptist evangelical fundamentalist uh, slash background, and I was the last person that I ever expected to become Catholic. Uh, and uh, for me, really, the most difficult part of it was explaining to my very devout Baptist parents that I'd made the decision to become Catholic. How did that go down? And it, it was difficult. It's probably, that was the, it was the most difficult thing. And, um, and I had to explain to them that this is not a rejection of you. You raised me to be a man of God. And uh, I'm only taking what you've given me to its logical conclusion, which is the historical church. And had to kind of explain where we 
where we had gone our, our separate ways. And that first meeting was really difficult. But the second time we talked, which was the next day, their questions were not combative, but they were more uh, uh, curious. They wanted, then they really had some questions. Well, okay, how does, how do the Catholics explain this? And well, how do you, how do you, how do you justify doing it this way instead of that way? And, and this was the fun time for, for me, because I could just answer the questions straight out without, without them being challenging. And, and they were genuinely wanting to know why I had made this decision because they knew me to be a very devout Christian. So they, they knew that I hadn't been kicked in the head or anything like that, right? <laughs> and um, and my, my father saying at the end of the conversation, well, you're telling us something that we never, you're telling us things we never knew. Hmm. And so... Not took humility. Yeah, that, that it showed the, the humble man he was. And, and my wife, my, my mother was the same same way, very humble about it. And my father passed away um, in, the, uh, in the early 2000s, but then my television show came out on EW10 about that time. And my my faithful Baptist mother never missed one of my shows. Oh, <laughs> she, fantastic. She watched it every Sunday night. But to, to answer your question more specifically, what was it that did it? What what was that at some point, you know, I knew I was on the road there and I was I was in that trying to get out of a stage, that that third stage of I still I can't do this. I I can't do this. But knowing I'm going to, I'm going to. But I'm I'm gonna wait as long as I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> and uh Finally, I I got into an argument with a very good friend of mine who was in the process of leaving the Catholic Church, and I was in the process of coming in, and we finally just hit right there, and we just had really what I would characterize as a very violent argument, and it ended with me driving away saying, "I have to become Catholic. This is the only this is the only way forward now. Um, I have to do what Chesterton himself did," and. So that last step was following Chesterton all the way into the Catholic Church. Mm. How that's wonderful. How was he received by Catholics? How was Chester received by Catholics? Yeah. Oh, they they were hurting themselves by crowing so much. They were so happy to have landed Chesterton <laughs> in the church. But I can tell you, there was one fear on the part of Catholics too that somehow Chesterton was going to change, that he wouldn't be the same witty joyful guy that somehow the church would ruin him yeah and so there was that that was actually expressed by several writers uh catholic writers when chesterton became catholic but for the most part it was ecstatic uh, they were there was just such mm. such great joy especially from leading catholic figures and and bishops and archbishops now he was probably aware of sort of intellectual heavyweights within the church even as an anglican but did he find kind of fellowship among other intellectual Catholics once he came in? Well, the one he always w was in fellowship with was Hilaire Belloc, who okay, was... yeah. Tell you know, us about their relationship. An intellectual giant. And first of all, tell us who Hilaire Belloc <laughs> is for those who don't know. Yeah, so, um, you know, <clears throat> it's it's funny how history works. Sometimes, you know, there can be generations without intellectual giants. And here you had two who were best friends at the same time, both of them profound and and uh, giant intellects who wrote prolifically about all the same things and, you know, uh, public figures, outspoken. Belloc uh, was was more political than, than Chester. He actually was a member of parliament for a while. Mm -hmm. He was a very witty poet uh, and... Uh, and more of a gruff character. That's what I was going to say, yeah. a little more cutting maybe. Yeah, yeah, Ch Chesterton's the... The, the good cop and Belloc's the bad <laughs> cop see. all the all the way. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think Joseph Pierce does it explains it best that um, he says Chesterton was was polite to people who were rude to him, and Belloc was rude to people <laughs> who were polite to him. You know, the the, the example I, I told you the earlier story about the, the the woman accosting Chester. Why aren't you out at the front? You know, and being witty in his response and. Whereas Belloc was at a, at a mass once, and yes, I know that. The, <laughs> the usher comes up to him and says, "Sir, at this point of the mass, we stand and or we kneel, or whatever, whatever it was." Belloc wasn't doing it, and <laughs> Belloc turned to him and said, "Go to hell." <laughs> and uh, the usher says, "Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know you were Catholic." <laughs> and uh, and so he, uh, he, he. The other thing about Belloc is he really. 
Mm. He, he was a man who dealt with much more tragedy personally than uh, mm. than Chesterton had to deal with. Although Chesterton had his own own share of tragedy, I think that's sometimes downplayed uh, because he was so joyful and and dealt with the tragic events in his life so well. Mm. But Belloc <clears throat> lost his wife at a young age. He lost a son in World War One and another son in World War Two. I mean, just unimaginable a heartache that he went through. And uh, and so there was always this uh, a weight of sorrow he was carrying, and yet the their friendship they always defended each other in public. Uh, the great line of of Chesterton is that uh, Belloc and I are completely different. We just happen to agree on politics and religion. <laughs> And I think, you know, uh, Shaw characterized them as the, sh- the Chester Belloc, that they were just one four-footed beast. Really? But they, they were really <laughs> two Chester different Belloc. men. And, it was like a horror story. Uh, yeah, yeah. The Chester Belloc. Yeah, the Chester Belloc. And I think the, the, they, they can be put together t- too easily sometimes because they were living at the same time, defending the same things, and were friends. Uh, and, and Did so, they become friends after his conversion? Oh, no, that friendship started way before his conversion. They became, they, they met each other in about 1902, and, and, and Chesterton was so impressed with, with Belloc. He, he said he, he, was, he thought he was one of the most intelligent men he'd ever met, and he, he came into the room with the smell of danger. <laughs> so he was this forceful personality right. to go with it, and yeah. uh, I think in many ways Chesterton was in awe of Belloc. But Belloc, in turn, realized that there was nothing in the world like like Chesterton either, and in, he wrote these great, wonderful poetic defenses of of Chesterton, the remote and ineffectual Don who dare attack my Chesterton. <laughs> I was unaware. <laughs> really funny, and uh, um, and then you know the bait, the the really great irony, Matt, was that Belloc never thought Chesterton would become Catholic and never even believed that he should become Catholic. He, he almost felt he was more effective hmm. without being a member of the church and defending it as an outsider that somehow gave him more credibility and, and really was going to counsel someone against trying to talk Chesterton into becoming a Catholic. And when, when Chesterton was received, Belloc was absolutely shocked and, of course, then was was very thankful and he 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 wrote he wrote to Gilbert saying, I, I still can't believe this this wonderful news. And mm. and so so they, they, they shared that. And of course the at, at Chesterton's funeral, Belloc was fi- found at the nearby pub, you know, lit- literally weeping into his beer. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think for men to be best friends or to be very close friends, that the two of them have to almost want to be like the other one in one respect. You know, they have to really admire each yeah, other. Yeah, that's a very good point. They they really do admire each other, and that's that's why they continue to support each other all the way. Yeah. Mm. So, did your wife ever become Catholic? If- yes, she did. Um, so, what happened? You know, she had been raised Catholic and had left the faith, uh, and. and Kind of, uh, kind of for intellectual reasons, because she had never been well catechized in the faith. But she, she had a Catholic sense of things, which she would say things to me in our early marriage that would trouble me because I didn't have good answers for them. Because she'd say, "This is what the Catholic Church believes." In fact, she was the first one who explained the Catholic view of the Eucharist to me, which mm. was totally new yeah. for me as a as a Baptist. Yeah, Baptist too, yeah. and so, um, so. We had, as uh, as evangelicals, uh, evangelicals are always looking for a better church. And they're, that's why so many of them do become Catholic, because they're always looking for a better church, right? But we uh, we couldn't find that better church, so we started home churching. Mm-hmm. Because since there's no sacrament, we didn't know this was the reason, but there's no, there's no sacrament at the Baptist church, so you don't... You don't need to go to a church. You can do all that stuff at home. You can sing. And if, you, and if you're home church, you, you have a better you have better odds at keeping the pesky, annoying Christians out. Yes, you know, that's when, true. When you've got billions of people in your church, that's true. And you could limit the number of announcements at each service that's too. True. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we were home churching. You know, singing and praying and reading the Bible and <clears> me giving lessons. And of course, it was a utter failure. But. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, I'm getting closer and closer to the Catholic Church. During the week, I'd sneak into Catholic churches to pray because there, mm. there was some kind of presence there that I was aware of, you know. <laughs> well, then one day I said to my wife, I said, we need to start going to church again. And she said, yeah, yeah, we do. 
And then I said, it has to be the Catholic Church, by the way. <laughs> and she said, what? <laughs> you know, the whole double detached <laughs> elastic jaw. Good. And then I said, yeah, here, you need to read these books. <laughs> they were right by your side. <laughs> and God bless her, she she did. And, and she read and... Um, you know, because she had all kinds of arguments that she'd learned from, from me. So she had to unlearn those arguments that mm. I had given her. You know, I had to undo the own damage. But so she read several several books, and w- one of them was uh, Scott Hahn's uh, uh, Rome Sweet Home. It's amazing how much of an impact that it's book has had incredible. and continues yeah. to have. And I, of course, I, at that point is when I had read the, the whole catechism, too, which mm-hmm. was such a positive experience for me because... Reading it, I realized there's nothing defensive about it, just a straightforward exp- explanation and a beautiful explanation of the, of the Catholic faith. And I was just smitten by it. Mm-hmm. But uh, So Chesterton had done his work on me. The Church Fathers had done his their work, but, but also it's, some of these recent conversion stories were kind of, oh, yeah, that's what I went through. I went through that, too. So, so she read a lot of these same books, and now she is a very devout uh, mm-hmm. Catholic, and um, we... Uh, you know, a weird thing happens. After we were married, we we had our requisite boy and girl, and 10 years go by, and we become Catholic, and then for some reason we had four more children. Remarkable right? how that, that happens. Weird? It's, I, so it's wild. And, and the the uh, amazing thing is if we hadn't had those other children, we would have never have started Chesterton Academy. So wow. that Praise conversion God. led to a lot of good things. From what you know about Chesterton, what do you think his advice would be to Catholics today who are scared about confusions and ambiguities coming out of Rome or the liturgy wars, for example, if he had a YouTube channel and he wanted to say something, what, what kind of advice do you think he would give or side he would take? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, Chesterton says that the devil's great tool is ambiguity. The, you know, Satan always uses ambiguity. And uh, so he would, he would always, I would think, on his YouTube channel, try to point to clarity and try to not give anybody the wiggle room that ambiguity allows. And uh, I think he would, he would try to hone in on the truth in everything. Um, he would always stress obedience to the, to the church because um, for him, uh, that was very important to him uh, in, in defending, defending the church. You can't, you can't defend the church by attacking the Pope. You just can't defend the church by attacking the Pope. Um, what, it, what does this do to, to outsiders if, if, we, if we send that mixed, that mixed message? With, and, you know, he would point to the historical church that there's been turmoil throughout the history of the church, and, and he'd point out that that's one of the reasons why the, the, the evidence is for the fact that it is God's church on earth, that it is truly the presence of Christ on earth because it has survived all of its own mismanagement. He, he uses almost that exact same phrase. Okay. And so um, I think he would always caution patience and hope and just being faithful to the Catholic Church. You know, what I try to do, you know, channeling as much of Chester as I can is say, look, it's not, it's not about who the Pope is. It's about who you are. You, you, mm. The people that you know as your neighbors or that you meet at, at, at work, doesn't matter what their attitude is towards the local bishop or the Pope. It's what their attitude is towards you. You have to be the Catholic Church that they see because you're, you, you're going to be the closest thing they have to the Catholic Church. So that, yeah. that's how we evangelize. The failure on the part of the bishops and or Pope to not alleviate us to be good and not, to be faithful and to teach what Christ taught and to... Yeah. We're, we're not entitled to despair, as Chesterton says. Oh, that's good. That's very good. L- let's take a break so that we can, I don't know, have a whiskey or something. Oh, that's good. And then we'll, we'll come back, and I'd love to ask you about some, uh, some anecdotes, can, uh, more anecdotes of Chesterton, and we'll take some questions from our local supporters. Very good. Thanks. I got to tell you guys about my new favorite app. It's called Ascension and it's by Ascension Press. This is the number one Bible study app, in my opinion. And uh, you can go to ascensionpress.com slash frad. Go there. 
uh, and so that way they know that we sent you. It is absolutely fantastic. It has the entire Bible there, very well laid out. The, the whole Bible is read to you by Father Mike Schmitz, or just sections of the Bible. It has the catechism there. It's cross-referenced absolutely beautifully. It's really actually quite difficult to explain to you how good this is. Just download it and check it out for yourself. It even has over 1,600 frequently asked questions about Scripture. So if you go to Genesis 1, you might have a question about evolution. Well, there's a drop-down right there. You can read an article article that'll help you understand it. Um, I went through it with the guys at Ascension the other day and my mouth, my jaw was just, it, had, it was dropped. It, it was absolutely amazing. Um, it's had tens of thousands of five-star reviews. Again, go to ascensionpress.com slash Brad. It also has all of their amazing Bible studies. So I remember back in the day I had a big DVD case of Jeff Caven's Bible studies. Well, it's all there on the app. So go download it right now. Please go to ascensionpress.com slash Brad. I would smoke too, except my if I talk, my pipe just goes out. So yeah, yeah. Um, giving up bread. Go. <laughs> oh, so well, I always um, treat Advent the same way as Lent. Take make it a time of you know certain privations. So I mm -hmm. I give up bread and wine. You know, someone say, "Well, you what? You mean you give up the Eucharist?" I say, "Well, that's not bread and wine." Smarty. But yeah, so we don't have to go there. But yeah, I give up bread and wine for Advent and Lent. And I have to say that giving up bread is more difficult than it giving is, up wine. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't. I don't Staff eat, of life. I, I make a choice, not, a choice not to eat bread. It doesn't sit well with me. But um, it is hard. Yeah, it's very yeah, hard to give up yeah. bread. What do you prefer, wine to beer? What's your favorite drink? Well, I, I do. Wine is my favorite uh, alcoholic drink. And I. Because I, it was Chesterton's? Well. No, I think it's because it has to do with Dale. I don't like beer at all. I don't drink beer at all. I've yeah. never been able to develop a taste for it. And some people just don't. I'm, I'm like that. Okay. I actually like, if I'm going to drink beer, it's like a Russian stout. Like a dark, not terribly carbonated. Yeah, I've I've had a couple of stouts that had, you know, raspberry or cherry in it or something. And something to mask the beer taste in it. I've almost been able to finish the entire glass, <laughs> but yeah. So I I prefer um, I prefer a Chardonnay most days, but then I'll have a Cabernet Sauvignon the mm -hmm. other days. And uh, Washington State Washington State wines are my favorite wines. Okay. Big wine culture in Australia. I'm from South Australia. There's a lot of makes sense. There. Yeah, we were there recently. My wife and I. Well, not recently. Many years ago, actually, but. Uh, they have this sparkling red is popular in Australia. Okay, well, that's because now this now the sparkling you know rosé is making a big comeback okay. right now. I, there was an entire pink wall of glass in my local bottle shop. It's really become popular again the rosé. But I have to say that you know this this uh, I was in San Francisco and some people came up to me so Dale, what kind of wine do you like? I'm in San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just across the bridge from Napa uh, County. Oh. And I, I said, well, I, Washington State wines. And they just spread away like I poured oil in the... <laughs> but another guy came up to me, looked both So ways. I don't know enough about... is is I don't know enough about that. Is it... Yeah, Napa, it? Napa Valley is the wine That's center. In America. Of, yeah, yeah, in America. Yeah, yeah. I mean... So to want something from Washington State when is, you're there... When you're right there next yeah. to the Mecca is... So you must be something wrong with you. I see. But then this other guy comes up to me, looks both ways, makes sure no one hears him. He says... I used to, I used to, I'm a wine merchant, but I spent in the wine selling business for 40 years. The best growing region in the world is Washington state. <laughs> and then he snuck away. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even say goodbye. Just yeah, yeah, slinked yeah. Off. So, uh, justified my, my palate. You seem like the kind of man who would have a few good jokes up your sleeve. Well, I do have to tell it the occasional joke. Did you want to hear a joke? I love, I love, I'm a collector of jokes. Okay. I like good jokes. Well, I, I've used this one a lot, so stop me if you've heard it. No, okay. don't stop me. I'm going to tell it anyway. Yeah. So this guy goes to the zoo because he wants a job, because he's always wanted to work in the zoo. And he goes to the zookeeper. He says, I'd like to work here at the zoo. I've always wanted to work here. Zookeeper says, we don't have any openings. He says, no, you don't understand. <laughs> I've always wanted to work in the zoo, and I'll do anything. i, I got to start working at the zoo. I'll do anything. The zookeeper says, anything? Yeah. Well, okay. 
Our, uh, our gorilla just died. Gorilla, the most popular act at the zoo. Until we can get a, a new gorilla, we have to have someone dress up as a gorilla. Otherwise, our admission and our attendance is going to just plummet. I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Put on the monkey suit right now. You start today. So the guy goes out into the gorilla exhibit dressed as the gorilla. And he does a very credible job. The crowds love it. In fact, the attendance even goes up because he's such a great gorilla. One day he's climbing up in a tree in the gorilla exhibit. It's got a branch going over the fence into the lion's exhibit. So he goes out there, starts shaking the branch and harassing the lion. The lion comes up, rawr, 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 and everybody loves it. It's just great. They, then the attendance really goes up. And so one day he's out there hanging on the branch. And you know what happens, right? You know what happens. No, the branch breaks. Yeah. falls into the lion's exhibit. The lion starts coming towards him. The crowd's pressing their faces up against the fences because they want to see blood. And the guy sees the lion coming closer. He looks at the crowd. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. He's getting scared. Finally, he just goes, help! <laughs> and the lion says, shut up or we'll both get fired. I've heard it, but you tell it way better than how I've heard it. That was very good. It's good you told me not to stop you. <laughs> here, here's, a, here's a quick joke. Okay. A screwdriver walks into a bar, and the bartender says, my goodness, we've got a drink named after you. And the screwdriver says, what? You got a, you got a drink named Steve? <laughs> All right. So okay. that's a question. <laughs> that's with, a good uh, one. Where get to, yeah. Of, uh, sorry. <laughs> Questions there. So this fella... He's at a funeral because his best mate's died. And the widow's next to him and she says to him, would you mind getting up and just saying something? So he walks up and adjusts the microphone to his mouth and he, he just says one word, plethora, and walks down and stands back beside her. And she pats him on the back and says, thanks, that means a lot. <laughs> Better? <laughs> Worse. The same. That was same. exactly the same as the screwdriver. But the screwdriver one was good. Plethora as good. Okay. Okay. See, all the ones that I think are really funny are really ones I shouldn't be telling on this show. Yeah, I've got a really funny one that I won't tell on this show <laughs> right. either. But we'll, it's, afterwards, it's, we'll... it's right on the edge of being able to be told on this show. Mine about. are so far past the edge yeah. that they can't even see no, the no, mountain. Mine's just on the edge, but it's really funny. <laughs> all right. Uh <laughs> Andrew C. says, please ask Dr. Alquist uh, to discuss the contrast between Chesterton and Kierkegaard's philosophies. This doesn't sound like something you'd be that interested in, but if you are, give it a shot. Well, uh, their concept of paradox is remarkably the same. The idea of um, the, the, the two truths that contradict each other that are both true. But with Chesterton, he would argue that it's an apparent contradiction, whereas... Kierkegaard would argue that it is a contradiction, a logical contradiction. Um, but they're, it's they're, it's they're, both, they're both trying to get at the same idea, that there's this truth that goes above our logical comprehension. And uh, in, in both cases, the ultimate paradox is Jesus Christ himself, fully God and fully man. And I think Chesterton and Kierkegaard would, would simply agree on that. They also very similarly uh, have this idea that it's almost they almost use exactly the same line that where biology leaves off that's where theology begins uh, that that there, there's something that's transcendent about theology where they would differ obviously uh, Kierkegaard who I think was on his way to becoming Catholic uh, if he'd lived longer on that William Blake C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis trajectory wasn't Catholic whereas as Chesterton was but I see evidence of Kierkegaard starting to uh, express great admiration for monasticism and for the historical church. Obviously, he was a big Augustine fan, uh, as all Lutherans were. He was of a of a Lutheran mm -hmm. background, but he didn't he didn't really care much for the state church in in uh, uh, Denmark. Um, but uh, uh, Kierkegaard's whole weakness can be summed up by the fact he didn't read Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we own a Chesterton Cigar Lounge up the road, and our general manager, Matt McCloskey, asks, what does he think we should name our Chesterton Cigar? Well, I think uh, the, the, the Gilbert would not be bad. The, the Gilbert? Yeah, like that, yeah. The Paradox would not be bad. Um, 
I like both of those. The How about good, the, yeah. or, or the tremendous trifle? Okay, uh, what's that from? That's the name of one of his books of essays. The okay. tremendous trifles. There you go, Matthew. If you're listening, there's a, so those are some options. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about distributism. Uh, and I'm a newbie. Every time people try to explain this to me, I, 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 th I think I must be stupider than I originally thought, which is quite significant. Um, so maybe you can help me. So the question from Mitch is, did Hilaire Belloc influence Chesterton's conversion to Catholicism? Well, we've discussed that, but how did they develop distributism? So um, let me just uh, answer the first part of that question a little bit more. Okay. I think obviously Belloc had a huge influence on Chesterton's uh, conversion. But he also may have had a, uh, an influence preventing his conversion, because uh, there I told about Belloc's own uh, strange reservations about Chester becoming Catholic, but also um, Chester does say something in his book, The Catholic Church in Conversion, that is very telling. He says, "Let it never be forgotten that to the potential convert, anything that a uh, enemy of the Catholic Church should say will have no effect on him whatsoever. Mm. But one wrong word from a Catholic Ooh. can do great, great damage. And I just wonder what Catholic it was who did something to Chesterton that slowed his conversion down. And it may have been below. It's, may have been. Now, as far as, um, as far as his influence on Chesterton in terms of distributism, it was clearly Belloc who first explained the concept to him. Uh, Belloc, Chesterton, and most of the people of their circle had gone through their own young person stage of socialism. Mm -hmm. One of the great lines that's always attributed to Chesterton that we have no evidence he ever said it, but of course is, you know, if, if a young man is not a, a socialist by the time he's mm -hmm. 20, he has no heart, and if he's still one when he's 40, he has no mind. It's a great line. I don't think Chesterton said it. Um, but they they all were reacting against the 19th century industrial capitalism that was a blight on the face of, uh, of Europe, but especially in the uh, major cities of, of England, Manchester and, and London. And they just saw the ugliness of the factories and the oppression of the workers. And naturally, the only... Uh, Thing they knew about was the reaction of, of socialism against it. Then they encountered Pope Leo the Thirteenth and his Rerum Novarum, who just condemns this industrial capitalism, which he says has led to a condition that is little better or no different than slavery. And he says in Rerum Novarum, eighteen ninety one, the wrong solution is socialism. So he condemns capitalism and socialism in the same encyclical. He says the solution is for workers to become owners. More workers should become owners. They should, they should share a stake in, in the, uh, the benefit that they bring to a, a company and to a business, that they should benefit from it by, by having their own autonomy. And uh, ultimately, if they're, we, we know that slavery is bad, autonomy, freedom, ownership is the solution. And that, that is the nut of the idea. It comes from Rerum Novarum, and Belloc got it, and he explained it to Chesterton, and Chesterton got it. And then that began a movement uh, that unfortunately took on the, the name distributism. Mm -hmm. And it's because of a line in Rerum Novarum that uh, Pope Leo used. He said, justice should be distributive. In other words, everyone's entitled to justice. But because he said it that way, Belloc, for some reasons, called the movement distributism or distributivism, which oh. is even worse. And they okay, all... So he coined the term. Yeah, it was Belloc. And everyone didn't like it when he first said it. And Belloc didn't like it that much himself, but they kept using it and kept complaining about the term. And, and, and Chester says it's... It's it's descriptive. It's correct, but it's it's just an awkward word, and it, it continued to be an awkward word. And we, when we first started the Chester Society, you know, twenty five years plus ago, we said we're going to come up with a better word, and we had a contest, Matt. We even offered a free T shirt to the person who free would come up with a. I know 
What more do you want? No one came up with a better word. I want but, to know what some of the contenders were. Oh, ugly. Really bad, ugly. Nice. No, you don't yeah. want to know. Yeah, you don't want to know. It's people who people who wanted to uh who who wanted to you know prove that they were insane or had no concept of human communication came up with terms. Yeah. So we finally after a big discussion around my dinner table one night came up with localism. This was just within the last uh, 3 years. Mm. And localism has an immediate immediate meaning. Everyone knows right away. Oh, yeah, that means let's keep business local and let's keep commerce local. That's Catholic social teaching, the idea of subsidiarity, the idea that what affects you most directly, you should have control of. Mm -hmm. And the idea of localism is your neighbor. Solidarity is the other concept of Catholic social teaching. So you're taking care of your neighbor as well as your yourself. And so what you do then has this local benefit and a benefit to um, to yourself as well. And so that became the the new term that we are using more and more and people are starting if you did it yourself in our early, in the early you said you I said the word localism yeah. i heard you say it it was great so there you go i didn't know that distributism was thought up by what's his face yeah Batlock, and i didn't know that you by and by your, what's his face your, you yeah. and your people came up with yeah what's his face no came with the one what's his face came with the <laughs> other amazing. yeah now and and now, so, why you, so why do you like localism why did you not like distributism just because of how it rolled off the tongue or? well yeah it it, because you immediately had to explain what it meant. Well, yeah, and then you also have to immediately ask who's the one doing the distributing. Yeah, exactly. Because it, kind of it, it, it it implied that someone had to be doing the distributing. Yeah. So there was way too much to explain with that word, mm -hmm. which is really a testimony to its its badness and worthlessness as a word. Localism, yeah. you don't have to explain <laughs> that at all. Everyone immediately <clears throat> knows what it means, and then you can expound on on how we apply localism. And so that's... I think an answer to somebody's question how, somewhere. It is. How? <laughs> here's another question from someone. How do you practice localism in your own life and in your own company? Well, I can answer that. Good. I started a school. Uh huh. And that's been the most localist thing I could have ever done. And now I've had the great privilege of helping other people start their local schools because all of them are started locally. We aren't starting them. They are starting them where they are. And we are just simply giving them the tools they need to start it. And are you hoping to get to the point, or are you already at the point where teachers participate in the financial gains of the business? Well, um, I guess, you know, it's, it's a nonprofit organization. There's, there's no owner, but there's just all the local investors. Everybody's invested in it with their with their blood and their sweat and their tears because it's for the benefit of their school, of their children, and of their community. With a nonprofit organization, of course, that's what it is. There's no owner per se, but uh, everybody signs up for uh, a cause, as it were, and they, they share the benefit. Yes, as the school improves, the teachers get paid better. All right. Um, that doesn't sound terribly different to like a capitalist small business to me. Well, uh, a capitalist small business is one main person is benefiting from it and everybody else is working for him. I see. No, there's no one person benefiting, and no one's working for one person. Uh, with a nonprofit, uh, your a board of directors is directing how the money is spent and making sure that it's financially sound, and they are not benefiting from it at all. Gotcha. I'm seeing beautiful kind of fruits of what we might call localism here in Steubenville. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we got a Steubenville. Uh, grocery box about to start up down the road where we're actually going to be selling the produce of the farmers who live around here. Um, are you seeing this taking that, off? Absolutely. More more? Every, the, who doesn't love the concept of the farmer's market? Everyone loves it. Everyone loves it. It's just, you don't even have to try to defend it because everyone knows it. That it's, it's the right thing. It's like we're supporting our neighbors. Yeah. And, and the money's staying local. Yeah. Yeah. So do you... Uh, do you shop on Amazon? Do you mind me asking? Or do you... um, I I only shop on Amazon if I know I'm going to be going to confession the next day. Okay. Now I I try to avoid Amazon at all costs. It's it's just it's a, a way of watching your money flee from the community and you're stealing yeah. it from your neighbor. Stealing it from you and oh by yeah. not by not yeah. giving it to them. Yeah. We have a local bookstore here down the road in Steubenville. Yeah. You you know Go a local them. a local community yeah. should be buying their books from the local bookstore and not That's good. not buying it from you've you've convicted from, me here because I just bought a uh, 
I just bought something on Augustine's commentary on on the Beatitudes today on Amazon this morning yeah, on he, my phone when I was sitting next door to a bookstore that would have really loved my business. Yeah, so and they could you. they could have ordered for you and yeah. they would have gotten part of the profit and you would have yeah. supported them. And I would have dealt with the fact that it came in a week after I would have liked to have gotten it or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's a good example. I there's certain names of big cor- big corporate retailers that are never used by the Alquist family. We some just don't of it, it is what uh, difficult to get around, isn't it? I mean, what, it, it's Apple, a, Google? You, you, you have, have to, to purposely get around it, yeah. You should just try to find a way to get around it. Uh, there's certain things that, yeah, uh, by when they're, when they're that all pervasive, there is no other choice. But that's right. what Ch- Chesterton's great argument is that capitalism ends in monopoly. It ends like a game of monopoly. One person owns everything. Mm-hmm. And that's not a good thing. No one thinks a monopoly is a good thing unless they. But but when you have like, of. but when you have uh, these two options, as you're saying, it, you, I suppose you might need them. Like you might need to use an Apple computer or a or a or a uh, Windows yeah, PC. We we haven't found a good right right now. There's not a good local <laughs> computer to use. It's true. But once there is, yeah, we just. I'm going to buy my yeah. seventy thousand dollar laptop. <laughs> from there. I mean, is is. There's, there's certain things where we, if we don't have choice, we don't have choice. But there's yeah. so many things where we do, we do have, have choice. choice. And, and we, sh- we shouldn't let the fact that we, we don't have choice in certain areas, yeah, alleviate us with the responsibility of those. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. I like that. It's, it's a what, self-tax, if you want to put it that way. We may have already discussed it, but what are some ways you think people misunderstand localism when they're talking to you? Uh, other than the fact that they think it's socialist. Yeah, um, th- that's the first one. But they... they uh, always seem to think you're somehow interfering with the American dream that uh, somehow uh, you're trying to prevent me from becoming a millionaire. <laughs> and are you? Um, well, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, if, if, if I could get to you, keep you out of hell. Yeah, I guess that, that'd be one. <laughs> and what, what does Jesus say about rich people? Yeah. Harder to, it's hard. It's not impossible, but if you can get that camel through the eye of a needle, you know, then you can get a rich man into heaven. It'll be a little more effort. But but Chesterton says the way people interpret that verse is they're always trying to manufacture larger needles and breed smaller camels. Yeah. But everyone is afraid that you might be interfering with their ability to become a millionaire as if that's where their happiness lies. Well, let me see if I understand why they might think that and why that might be a problem. Um. Well, I suppose, I mean, there's no, the church doesn't say you should make this much money and no more. So there's no kind of direct, explicit sort of condemnation of riches in the way there is of, say, sexual all, immorality or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, it doesn't. So we can, we can, we, we do, we do presumably know it, there are rich people who go to heaven and poor people who go to hell and they can use their riches well, right? We know that. Yeah. But what, what it does say is that to whom much is given, much will be required. So in other words, mm. if you... If you can you, make a million dollars. You, it's going to be just all the harder for you to get to heaven. Yeah. That's what it means. You can have more difficulty by by complicating your life with distractions that will somehow fight in the way of your spiritual life. Mm-hmm. Just just like th- there's that horrible verse in in the epistle of St. James, let not many of you become teachers. Right, which we all gloss over, don't oh, we? Gloss it right over. Yeah, mm. and you know, I think about that a lot because when you're teaching, just think if you say one thing wrong, the the ramifications of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it says we'll be judged with greater strictness. We who teach will be judged with greater strictness. It's almost as bad as having more money. Mm. And yet, you wouldn't discourage people from being teachers no, necessarily. You, not necessarily. And you wouldn't discourage people from being rich. But you just give them the full the full uh, caveat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think, but it goes back to your original question. Why, what are people, what is the thing, the fight against localism? They somehow feel like you're interfering with the American dream. But I, I think the American dream is, you know, a, know. a home with a family right. and, and a happy family in that home. Yeah. Yeah. And and from what you're saying about localism, you're, yeah. you're trying to give people more autonomy, not less. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Interesting. Well, thank you. That's a that's a good introduction, and one day I'll learn enough about it to speak about it for a longer period of time than three minutes. That's about as long as I can talk about it now. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Um, what is a great homeschooling resource for elementary age kids to introduce Chesterton? So this is not another softball for you to pitch your excellent school, but people who are homeschooling, when should they introduce Chesterton? Oh, when? Um, 
I thought the first question was, what's the homeschool resource? Oh, uh, homeschooling resource for elementary aged yeah. kids. Well, I, I Fair would, enough. You understood the question yeah. better than I did and I read it. I would recommend Homeschool Connections. Mm -hmm. um, that's an online uh, homeschool resource. They There are some courses there where they introduce Chesterton to, to uh, younger students. Um, and I do know that... Um, the, the the Seton uh, Homeschool has mm. some Chesterton books for uh, younger readers as well. Uh, Claire G says, what would Chesterton dislike about current public education teaching methods? <laughs> well, I, he was absolutely prophetic about that, Claire G. He, the things he talks, that he says about public schools in his own time are as true now as they were then. So he, one of his great lines, he says, uh, the one thing that is never taught in a public school is this, that there is a whole truth of things and that in knowing it and speaking it, we are happy. Oh, that is just delightful. That, that gets, so the, cat, the, the public school can't teach the truth and it can't teach the whole truth. It can just teach fragments that may or may not even be true. Mm. But what they aren't teaching is how that wholeness and the ability to articulate, to say it, is <clears> what <throat> makes us happy. And we are not teaching happiness in our schools at all. What would Chesterton says? Quack sib sliver sliver silver. Not a real name either way. I don't think. Sorry if I just offended you. Quack sibler. <laughs> what would Chesterton think about the internet had he lived today? I think Chesterton actually had a great prediction of the internet. <clears throat> he uh, during his time, of course, information was controlled by the newspapers. And it was really hard to have an alternative newspaper, which is what he did with when he edited GK's Weekly, his own newspaper, <clears throat> because you're going up against you know four or five major newspapers who are all all you know each of them owned by one very yeah. very rich powerful person. Because he said when you can control information, you have great power. He says people will line up for information, they'll line up for news like they line up for bread in a besieged city. And think about that. Mm -hmm. He says, but he says the day is coming when there will be a way to convey information cheaply to a large number of people. He says, I don't know how it will work. He says, it may be writing on the sky for all I know. But on that day, the Times will be behind the Times. In other words, the Times newspaper will mm -hmm. be behind the Times because it won't have the monopoly on information. And of course, that is what happened with the internet. There, there was suddenly a way to convey information cheaply to a large number of yep. people. Now, of course, we're starting to see controls on that flow of information. But there was, <coughs> there was a period of time when the internet really did, and it's still doing to some extent, offer alternative news. Mm -hmm. And it could be used for good in that sense. But the internet, like anything else, as Chesterton points out in his book on Thomas Aquinas, there are no bad things, only bad uses of things. Mm. Um, what are what are your thoughts? Asks Joe Brew on Montessori. So Montessori uh, was a Catholic woman who uh, developed this uh, school system that was originally Catholic, an educational system, and uh, in its most of its modern manifestation has been emptied of its Catholicism, but there are still a few traditional Montessori schools that still keep the Catholic aspect to it, which was really central to it because all education should be centered around some eternal truth. Mm. And, um, you, you know, the, uh, I don't think, I think it's a very powerful and effective educational uh, philosophy, but it is, it is one of, of many and it is kind of recent uh, on the scheme of things, and it's it's less classical, which would you know in some ways uh, be a point against it. But I I can't give it a big criticism because it is a very effective and a good system for for young children. Jake B says, "I'd like to send my children to a classical school, but don't have the option available locally at present. What does it take practically to get a Chesterton Academy school started?" Well. Thanks for asking that You're one. Yeah. Welcome. All right. So, <laughs> so, so go to uh, to Chesterton Schools Network dot org, Chesterton Schools Network dot org, 
and we have a very well laid out system of what you need to do to open a Chester Academy. And if you follow the steps on this great new system right now, if you call right now and, and, and you get the set of knives too, I'll throw that in. <laughs> no, if you go through, through our, our scheme, it truly is a step-by-step process so that you could open a school within 18 months. Mm. But it's, yeah, uh, so it's all explained what you what you will go to, what you will face, what your challenges will be, but what each thing that has to be accomplished in order uh, that will allow you to start the school. Okay. And if you have immediate needs and you're still homeschooling and you want a Chesterton curriculum, there is an online option hmm. for uh, for Chesterton Academy, and you can learn about that at ChestertonSchools.org as well. Matthew Smith says, can you discuss Chesterton's view of liberalism? My understanding is that G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc were quite critical of modern political structures, but I would love to understand their critiques and proposed solutions. So Chesterton and Belloc originally considered themselves liberals back in the early 20th century. They were members of the Liberal Party. And for them, um, it had, a, I think, a much different meaning than it is... Uh, has now, I, I think, you know, Chesterton said something very similar to what Ronald Reagan said uh, when he left the Democrat Party. He said, I didn't leave the Democrat Party, the Democrat Party left me. All right. Yep. And 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 Chesterton said something really similar. He said, you know, I'm the last liberal. E- everyone else, he said, has left the liberal uh, philosophy. I'm, I'm the last one who has the philosophy, which is freedom. That's what the word means. And uh, protecting those basic personal freedoms, and that the government's role is to ensure that those freedoms are protected. <clears throat> and um, and they have to do with deciding things for yourself. That, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> you swallowed wrong earlier, now it's my yeah, turn. It's great fun. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. Ah, still not there. Sorry. That's right. We'll both drink together. We'll just everyone take a drink break right now. Mm. <coughs> Vodka. That's what's the problem. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. That's right. Do you want me to? So um, that um, their view of liberalism, liberalism then was protecting <clears throat> basic liberties. That the that's what the government's role is. And not interfering with those liberties, but also allowing people to be autonomous to make their own decisions of what um, eventually became the same idea of subsidiarity, that the things that most directly affect you, you should be able to control. Right, right. And um, they just saw the liberal government becoming more and more controlling and taking away those basic freedoms like a... Uh, compulsory education act, a compulsory insurance act, and all these basic decisions being taken away from the common man, and and he really having the common man having no power or say in in, in the things that affect him yeah. at all anymore. So um, his in terms of uh, Chester's commentary on today's liberals versus conservatives, I think he has one line that epitomizes the problem exactly. He says, the modern world is divided into progressives and conservatives. Mm -hmm. It's the business of the progressives to go on making the same mistakes. And it's the business of the conservatives to prevent the mistakes from being corrected. (laughs) (laughs) It's the most painfully true line (laughs) in the world. We just watch it happen every day. Forrester 1241 says, GK was way ahead of his time in calling out the dangers of the eugenics movement. Ironically, he died just before the seeds of eugenics bloomed into the horrors of the Holocaust. Also, thanks to Matt's program, I became acquainted with Flannery O'Connor and ended up reading her works. There's a lot more to her than her Catholicity. When I read into her stories, it was obvious to me that she had her fingers on a pulse that would explode in society just after she died. The new morality and associated generation gap has done untold damage that society as a whole has still not fully assessed. What other social evils did Chesterton see coming other than the eugenics movement, he says? Yeah, so the eugenics movement, um, Chesterton was prophetic about it. He, he's, you know, he called it the argument against 
a scientifically organized society. He saw it as being an attack on the family, on life, and um, he said the way that the modern world would measure progress was first with contraception, then abortion, then infanticide. All the things that we're seeing. He also, before the end of his life, had some great arguments against euthanasia, which he also was very prophetic about, where we will start putting people to death because the argument will be that it's because they're a nuisance to themselves, but it will eventually put them to death because they're a nuisance to us. Mm-hmm. So he saw these social evils in their in their nascent stage, and he predicted where what they would look like when fully blossomed. His arguments against contraception are exactly the same arguments that St. Paul VI uses in Humanity. Humanity Vitae. Exactly the same arguments. So he, he that, that the human being would become instrumentalized. Yep. That that he said that he said it would lead to abortion for one thing. It did. It would lead to divorce. It did. It would lead to uh, mistreatment and abuse of women. It did. And it would lead to sexual perversion. That's right. It did. Yeah. So I'd like to go over some Chesterton quotes. Now, I typed in Chesterton quotes while you were speaking. <laughs> and, of course, the first thing that came up was this website called Chesterton.org. <laughs> Never heard of it? Anyway, it turns out, you know, most people, if you go to their quote page, there'd just be a list of quotes. But here, there are categories of quotes. So <laughs> let's have a look. Um He says, you say grace before meals. All right, but I say grace before the concert and the opera and grace before the play and pantomime and grace before I open a book and grace before sketching, painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing, and grace before I dip the pen in the ink. The way to love anything is to realize that it may be lost. I didn't realize. Is that a second? Is that that's a different quote? That's a different so, quote. I was, yeah. trying, I was trying to meld Can't the two and see how it together. That's because they don't quite go together at yeah. all. But really. yeah, the last, that first one, that one called Grace, it ends and Grace before I dip the pen in the ink. I mean that that shows Chesterton's always being thankful. Yeah. What, is, what do you hear in the mass? You hear we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. Yeah. We say that, we hear that every day, day at Mass, and yet... We don't do that. We don't, but Chesterton does. Chesterton says, I always am saying grace before I do all these things. I'm always being thankful because that is, he says, the highest form of thought. And that's what the Mass is telling us, to always be thankful, always and everywhere. If we are always thankful, we will not get upset, we will not get angry, mm-hmm. we will not get depressed be self-entitled because yeah everything we have is a gift and all we can Mm. do is try to keep giving the gift back forever Mm. he says the greatest gift giving is thanksgiving what's one of your favorite quotes from him that we haven't yeah that's one of those i I, i'll tell you that i'll tell you which is your favorite child yeah which is your favorite child i'll tell you so don't ask me no the uh there's a quote that i put on a plaque that i gave to mother angelica when i was um doing my show at EWTN and she had me as a guest on her show. And and I think it's a really great one. It's from uh, Heretics, his book Heretics. He said, um, charity means pardoning the unpardonable or it's no virtue at all. This is very close to Lewis, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm making the connection here to Lewis's quote you're about du- you're du- forgiving the unforgivable in and, you. Yeah. And now, now you're seeing where he got it, right? Yeah. And, and then he says, Hope means hoping when things are hopeless, or it's no virtue at all. And faith means believing the incredible, or it's no virtue at all. And there's faith, hope, and charity, but it's in its paradoxical state, you know, because forgiving the unforgivable sounds like a paradox, right? Yeah. But that's what we have to do. There's You forgive when there's just no reason for possibly forgiving. And you hope when there's no reason for hoping and you you believe when there's no reason for believing because it's it really is you have to do it out of virtue okay what was mother angelica like well the, talk about the some we, i was in a discussion with someone the other day she said have you ever met a saint and i forgot to say why well, yeah i met mother angelica i think she will be canonized and she was so full of life and yeah. it's just such great energy and uh uh and you know we we had the weird 
experience of kind of like what you're we're doing right now. We got to know each other on the air. That's that's how it happened yeah. and, because there's hardly any pregame at warm up at all. And uh, and she was absolutely delightful and just hit hit all the buttons just in the right place. But uh, but just had that uh, little bit of mischievousness in her at the, at the same time, mm-hmm. and yet this powerful ability to discern what was right and what was wrong and what was of the devil or not. So you had both this lightness and this very seriousness underneath it. In some ways, I think that's what the saints do. They they really are joyful, and yet underneath it, they they're doing battle with the devil. Yeah, that's right. There's something disarming about an old woman. But she was a powerhouse. Yeah. I don't know, there was a terrible, maybe not a great movie, but it had an interesting premise back in the day called Shallow Howl, where this fellow got the ability to see people for who they really were, their personalities. So maybe you're looking at a physically beautiful woman, but she's hideous because she's actually a horrible person, right? And I wonder what uh, she may have looked uh, even more muscular than, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's like the little flower should have been yeah. called the uh, the Iron Will right. or something, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Mother Teresa, I heard a story of someone who was, uh, I think, on death row. And uh, if I'm getting the story right, and he said that if any, if a priest had have come in, if the Pope himself had have come in, I would have rejected him. But this little old shriveled up nun from Calcutta comes and puts a miraculous medal in my hand. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's, really good. that's wild. All right. Um, right is right, even if nobody does it. Wrong is wrong. If everybody is wrong about even it. if everyone is even wrong if about everybody, it. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty straightforward and yet entirely quotable. I like the uh, I like that quote. Uh, the most extraordinary thing in the world is an ordinary man, his ordinary wife, and their ordinary children. Yes, isn't he, that just yeah. delightful? And he says the the, <laughs> the ordinary is more important than the extraordinary. He says. Nay, it is more extraordinary. <laughs> the ordinary is more extraordinary yeah. than the extraordinary. Yeah. Why is that? Because, because the ordinary thing is what we should be in awe of. It's the same concept as we should be in awe of the earth. We should be startled by the earth, not by the earthquake. Yeah, And we should be more in awe of the sun than of the eclipse. Because those, those exceptional things, well, they might be interesting, but isn't the earth more interesting than an earthquake? And isn't the sun more interesting than an eclipse, really, when it comes down to it? Aren't they the more important things? Yeah. Yeah, so the ordinary thing is the more extraordinary thing. Um, we often don't think in our modern society as of uh, um, curiosity being a sin. Aquinas has a whole article on why it is and how he opposes it to studiousness. We could think of curiosity is the enemy of wonder i think you'd agree with me uh what what can we learn from chesterton about that well yeah he's got the great line about wonder he says the world will never starve for want of wonders but only for want of wonder Hmm. and you know wonder is a, a humble attitude because you're truly just taking something in curiosity can sometimes be a selfishly motivated thing and that's the difference between wonder wonder and curiosity the one is humble and the other can be selfish. Yeah, yeah. Selfish, inordinate, for the sake of evil, something like that. Mm-hmm. I've shared this story on the show before, but I want to share it with you because I think you'd love it. We just had mulch put out the front of our house, and I told my children, especially my younger son Peter, to stop bloody jumping into it from the stoop, please, because we're planting things out there. It's very important. Do you understand? Look at me. You're not looking at me. Look at me. <laughs> Did what? Tell me what I just said, right? And so I was up in my room, and I see him jumping off the stoop directly into the mulch, and... Thankfully, I had the sense not to just quickly be like, what are you doing? So I opened up the window, Peter, <laughs> what are you doing? Well, he was teaching an injured bird to fly. So I watched him for a little bit. He had, there's a bird next to him and he's flapping his wings. <laughs> that's 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 the most beautiful thing I think I've ever, wi- almost uh, the most beautiful thing I've uh, ever witnessed. That's great. Because so when it, you were telling me, you were just giving me the urge to want to go over to your house and jump into the mulch. <laughs> well, we could film that. <laughs> <laughs> that actually might do quite well on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, this has been lovely. It's been just a joy to get to know you. It is weird to get to know each other on camera, yeah, but it's yeah. been a delight to chat with you. Likewise. And thank you so much, Matt, for having me here. Uh, anytime you want to talk about Chesterton, you know how to you know how to get a hold of me. All right. Yes, I definitely do now. And uh, we've mentioned your books. We'll put links to those in the descriptions. Mentioned to your, your excellent school and your, your society. Anything else we've missed that we should... Well, I think I should probably close with a great Chesterton quote. Okay, I like that. This is a good one. 
He says it's not always wrong to go down to the lowest promontory and look down on hell like Dante. It's when you look up at hell that a serious miscalculation <laughs> has probably been made. Very good. Dale Oquist, thanks so much. God bless. That's lovely.